The Linux Action Show is created by Jupiter Broadcasting. It's sponsored by Ting. Go to last.ting.com to save off your first device or plan and DigitalOcean. Go over to digitalocean.com and use our promo code LASTDIGITAL and then you can spin up your own Linux rig for free. Welcome to Linux Action Show, episode 354. My name is Chris. And my name is Noah. Hey, Noah. Good morning to you. Good morning, Chris. All right, Noah. So we have a big show this week. So last weekend, Noah was down at Scale 13X, and he has got us a ton of interviews. Now, we had a four and a half hour live event that we featured a bunch of interviews in, and we have even more exclusive interviews in this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. I think you are going to be super happy with some of the people we've got to talk to, some folks we've never had on the show before, some of our favorite projects featured in some of these interviews. And then in the news segment, we have got a whole bunch to talk to one of my favorite stories Dan Gilmore has switched to Linux and the fundamental reasons as to why he's done it are essentially him verbalizing the core reason I use Linux I'm really excited to break that article down for you it's a big one and we're going to talk about that uh, in the feedback segment we've got a whole bunch of great feedback from you guys and we have some really good picks this week as well and some great news about the XFCE project and looking ahead to the next version of GNOME which looks like it might be the best version ever so it is a huge show today Noah, huge show. Big show. Big, big show. Mm -hmm. So why don't we start with it's our... A, really, it's a spillover show. It is. Week. It is. Uh, well, yeah, last week we had a four and a half hour live stream in our regular Sunday spot. We'll have that linked in the show notes, uh, which is just, just a ton of show. I know it's a ton of show, but people who watch the whole thing say they love it. And it was just raw, mm -hmm. unedited. Uh, and then we're going to take out the best nuggets and some of the stuff you've never seen before. So you're going to see that. But first, Noah, first, don't get ahead of yourself. It is our picks. we got to do the picks. Yeah, it's our Runs Linux this week, and it comes from Unredditor. He runs. He submits that Runscape runs Linux. Now, the company behind uh, Runscape, a Jagex, does, and I'm going to play about a minute of this video. It's really an AMD commercial, but when you watch, you get to see the Linux stuff in action, and uh, we'll break it down from time to time, and it's really neat to see a very popular MMO powered by Linux. Jagex is a leading developer and publisher of online games. Our most successful title is RuneScape, which is a MMO fantasy game, and has had over 200 million players since 2001. So sorry. Has I'm sorry. It is Rune plus Scape. Sorry. Sorry. All right. So now if you look closely right there, now watch as this changes focus. You'll see that that's a Linux rig right behind him. A long history of innovation. Boom. Right there. You see you got your panel up there at the top. It looks like it's a GTK desktop, or it could be, uh, this looks like maybe this is Terminator, or maybe it's, uh, maybe it's a terminal desktop. I don't know. But uh, all right, let's keep going. in technology in both our games and in our infrastructure. Yeah, there we go. First games company to win the Queen's Award for innovation, and we continue to invest and evolve our infrastructure and our technology. Big data for Jagex means two terabytes of fresh data every day, game telemetry data. We know at which location certain players have which items fighting which monsters, and with that fresh data, we can allow our data analysts and our data scientists to produce really rich insights and allow us to make better business decisions that are more profitable and more fun for our players. CMicro helps Jagex tackle the challenge of big data through its fabric compute infrastructure. As a distributed platform, Hadoop runs really well on this type of high performance hardware. Additionally, we benchmarked our CMicro cluster at twice the speed of our equivalent 2U servers. The setup procedure for the CMicro is very straightforward. And I'll leave the uh, rest there, although there's a little uh, server porn for you. The uh, video will be linked in the show notes, but look at that, Noah. And so they run Hadoop on these uh, Linux boxes, processing all of their player data. Uh, there you can see on their desktops at their development stations, they're running Linux. I don't know if the game uh -huh. itself is released for Linux, but uh, it's pretty cool. Look at that nice rig yeah. there. Yeah, and, uh, and they, they know how to grab people's attention, right? Because anyone in this community is is always interested in hardware. Yeah, that's very true. So uh, there you go, the Jagex folks who uh, have the uh, RuneScape MMO, which I've never played, never even really heard of, and I don't think it's available for Linux, but I, it is it's so many times, even at these conferences, and, and Noah can attest to this too, we go to these places and they use Linux on the back end, but their whole front end, like, do you remember that uh, cable analytics company or that TV analytics company we talked to? Mm -hmm. They were all mm -hmm. Linux. That was scary. On the back end, all scary. Linux, but they don't even, they, mm -hmm. nothing they make sells, works on Linux, yeah. Right. 
Yeah, so. But even even uh, even even uh, even though they were using Linux, her entire presentation scared the ever living crap out of me. Yeah. She was talking about how they can gather analytics from which remote you use. So if you pause a given show and they know that you paused it in the living room and then you picked it up in the bedroom, they know that you like to watch that particular show in your bedroom and you like to watch this particular show in your living room, and then that gets that gets analyzed and then the data gets broken out and then categorized and then sent off to other people so that and then they sell it. Yep, it's remarkably super scary. creepy, and it was she was really mm-hmm. thrilled to tell us all about it too. So we're just like, <laughs> okay, all right, we're, and no one I was like, uh huh, okay, you're freaking us out. Uh, hey, yeah. uh, but uh, my son really liked the little remote key, uh, remote USB drive that she gave us. Yes, so that was cool. That was cool. Real time mm-hmm. follow up from the chat room. It's a browser based game. In fact, Krabby is in the chat room playing it right now, so it does wow. work under Linux. So there you go. There you go. Yeah, that's going to be more and more popular, right? Yeah. Is things just going to the web browser? Because now it works in Mac, Windows, Linux, Chrome OS, whatever. And, you know, WebGL is legit. Uh, I was doing mm-hmm. something just last night using WebGL, and it and it did make my fans spin up, but it was a really mm-hmm. cool demo. And, uh, and like, if you, or, like, if you go, like, uh, price out or spec a Moto X phone, the Moto X2, mm-hmm. the, when you customize it, the... the this the three D spinning and like the zooming in and 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 changing the camera is all WebGL mm-hmm. now. It's not using Flash anymore. So that's really wow. cool. Yeah. Yep. Hey, wow. no, you know Flash. what else? Flash needs to die a horrible death. So. Yes. Well, slowly, slowly but surely. You know what else is really cool? And uh, tell me what's cool. And I'll tell you, I never have Flash in it on any of my DigitalOcean droplets. That's right. It's DigitalOcean for sponsor of the Linux Action Show this week. Noah and I are huge DigitalOcean users. It's like it's come down to the point now where I really consider them my server room. When I need to deploy a Linux box, it's un- it's just there's no question. I deploy a DigitalOcean droplet. They make it crazy easy. It is simple and intuitive cloud hosting dedicated to offering the best and easy way to spin up your own cloud server in under a minute with pricing plans starting in only $5 a month month and you get 512 megabytes of ram a 20 gigabyte ssd one cpu and a terabyte of transfer a terabyte of transfer is included for five dollars a month uh if you are starting out your own podcast and you probably have maybe less than five thousand listeners uh i would seriously consider setting up a digital ocean droplet or two and just host your files up there it'd be less than a libsyn account and i would say for the most for the most case, uh, it's probably going to offer all of the transfer you're really going to need. Uh, so go over to DigitalOcean Plus. We have a promo code so you could try it out for a couple of months. There's a lot of things you could use a droplet for, but it strikes me as a podcaster uh, getting started. I would have loved something like this. And if you use our promo code Last Digital, well then you'll get a two month trial of their five dollar rig. Because what they do is they give you a ten dollar or they give you a ten dollar credit. However. We do have something kind of special. Normally, and it does support the show if you use Last Digital. So if you're listening to this, you know, uh, and Last Digital is a great way to support the show. But there is something special, Noah. Uh, we have a $15 credit. How do you want to hand that out? Because we could give out a $15 DigitalOcean credit to somebody, but I don't know how to get it. Yeah, well, I was just th- I was thinking about that. So um, back when we were at scale, uh, we had the good fortune of coming across somebody who gave me a whole stack of these cards uh, for $15 credit on DigitalOcean. So I was uh, I was just thinking about interesting ways to do that. If you're here on the live stream and you have something cool that you're doing with DigitalOcean that you like to do with DigitalOcean, if you ping me uh, during one of the breaks, I'll run out and grab a couple of those there cards and so, uh, hand uh, some of those out maybe. Ha- ask him in between now and the new segment. And, you know, like I like how saying Ham Radio in the chat room, he says, I administer a DigitalOcean droplet that's used to host my podcast. Uh, and uh, the video you're seeing of Noah right now, that is bouncing off of a DigitalOcean droplet right there. 720p, mm-hmm. 30 frames per second. DigitalOcean is amazing. On top of all of that, the $5 price tag, the one terabyte transfer, the all SSD infrastructure. They have data center locations in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, Amsterdam, and London. Multiple data centers in some of those areas. And their interface to manage all of this, the control panel, is really intuitive. Intuitive. It's it's really nice. It's very powerful, and you can replicate its functionality on a larger scale with DigitalOcean straightforward API. And there's so many great community apps already built around that API. It is one of my favorite things about DigitalOcean. Maybe may, I can't tell you. I couldn't tell you if it's the UI, if it's the LSSD, if it's the fact that it's powered by Linux, if it's the fact that it's cool people at the company, or that they have amazing tutorials. They're some of the best on the net. I I can't tell you what it is. Or maybe the fact that they support our shows and keep us on the air. There's a lot of things I love about DigitalOcean. So go over there and try it out. Use our promo code last digital. Two months free. You get that five you get that credit. Five dollar rig. You can run two months for free. Digital ocean. You, you can do one click deployments. It's amazing. Noah go. You know what I think it is, Chris? What's I that? think it's the incredible cost. 
uh, the incredible cost savings. I think it's the fact that it's so little cost that it gets to a point where I want to try something out. It's so oh, yeah. it's it's so much quicker and faster to just spin it up on DigitalOcean and at you know you don't even pay the five dollars because if you're just using it for a couple minutes they have like it's like point oh 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 seven cents yeah. for the hour. Yeah, and then yeah. problems. So who can't afford one hundredth of a, or or seven hundredths of a penny? Yeah. to try something out. Yeah, yeah, and actually it is what actually that uh, that much, very much worked for us when we were troubleshooting some remote connection stuff. I was like, all right, well let's put this mm-hmm. on a box that we know is outside of firewall, not going to have any NAT issues. Mm-hmm. Spin up a droplet, a mm-hmm. couple of minutes, test it. Oh, you know what? Guess what? It is that it works. Wow, that just saved us hours of troubleshooting. So it's really right. nice. Right. Not to mention the 45 minutes it would have taken to install uh, the, the operating system onto a box. Yeah. No, uh, our uh, our desktop app pick this week, when you suggested it, you actually suggested it like three weeks ago. And mm-hmm. I was like, uh, really, you want to do that one? Everybody knows about this one. And you're like, no, trust me, there's something really cool. And then you never, because you're ADD, you never finish your sentence. And then you brought it right. up again. And I was like, uh, I don't really want to talk about, th- dude. I that's like that's like picking VI. Everybody knows about VI, right? And then you're like, mm-hmm. no, no. Listen, this is what I use it for. It's really cool. And so we're going to bring it to the audience's attention because maybe like me, they didn't know that Bracero has some very advanced features. Bracero is our desktop app pick this week. It's an application to burn CDs or DVDs for the GNOME desktop. It's designed to be very simple. And Noah, you love it. I do. Tell me about so your first, love affair. I have to get. First, I have to give some credit to somebody. So I was in the mumble room, and I was in the middle of pulling my hair out, trying to get uh, a Windows VM spun up so I could use this uh, previous software I was using to uh, rip DVDs. Like virtual CD or and, something? Or, or? Say again? Any CD, even any DVD or like, what were you using? It, the, it was uh, DVD Fab is mm, what I was using. Mm. But it the the and it, but the the problem was it was having trouble with the virtual box pass through and it was a huge oh, pain sure. and it wasn't working quite right and uh, Rotten Corpse said why don't you just use Brasero and I said because uh, well, I don't want to make a copy of <laughs> I don't want to make a copy of a CD I burned and I don't want to rip a CD into an ISO I want to make a, a a rip of my actual yeah. DVD and he goes yeah, and no like, I can do that uh, well so I I stuck the DVD so he says in, I can rip a I, DVD. Right. So I stuck my DVD. So one of the things is I like to rip all my DVDs into ISO format, not into MKV or to AVI or any of those, because I like all of the original menus. I like to know that when I quote unquote backed up my DVDs, what sits on my server drive is indistinguishable from if I were to have put a DVD inside of the DVD player. And that's what I get when I rip ISOs. I get every last bit of quality. I lose absolutely nothing. And the experience is identical to if I was playing a DVD. So this um, has right here, like so we're looking at the Bracero UI. And so when you start mm-hmm. Bracero up, you say it says create a new project. You have audio project, data project, video project. I'll skip this one. Burn image. Now, we all know what those do, obviously. Right. In fact, burn image is nice and... Right. Video project is really cool. What you're cool. going to do is you're going to actually, you're gonna actually make a copy, copy of the disc. Yeah, disc right. copy. And then so you select the disc, which I don't have one on my drive right now. And then it just mm-hmm. makes a bit-for-bit bit, uh, ISO copy. Right. And so what it needs to do is it needs to decode because if those if those DVs are are uh, are encrypted, it has to it has to decode that. And when you the first time you put a DVD in, at least with Ubuntu, it will pop up and say, "You need to download uh, these codecs, the libcss, all that stuff. Would you like me to do that?" You click yes, you wait a couple seconds, an orange progress bar goes from the left to the right, and now you can rip DVDs. I'm it's sorry. that easy. Are you saying Bracero supports decrypting? Mm-hmm. It will dec- yeah, decrypt the DVDs. I've yet to have a DVD that I've put in Brasero, as long as it's an up-to-date version. I've yet to have a DVD that I've put into Brasero that it hasn't been able to rip. So I just realized if the underlying OS has support, it'll do. That's nice. So that mm-hmm. so some, some people in the chat room are like, well, why don't you just use DD? And that would be the key differentiator right there. Is then you have right. essentially a DRM-free ISO image. Right. Exactly. Exa- otherwise, you're relying on your on your device that you're playing back to be able to decode that stuff. And so, for example, I use the Western Digital TV Live. Um, it it wouldn't support it. It would it'll just say that it can't read the ISO if you if you use DD. Um, so, and the other thing is too is, I, and I, I'm not sure the technical details of it, but I think that there is is some sort of um, checking that goes on with brass uh, with brass area that DD doesn't do because I've had DD fail a couple times where brass areas work. So, and I, I don't I don't hmm. know enough about the underlying technology to tell you why that is. Um, I've just had better luck, but it's it's one of those software that it, it was always installed and it was one of those things where I kind of wondered why. I even came installed by yeah. default because who uses optical media yeah. before? Yeah. And now I it's I use it once a week. Yeah, I can least. I can see right here in plugins it has yeah it has a DVD CSS. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, that's nice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a really cool and, and and the chat room mentions there are some other like K3B can do some of this. Uh, 
I don't know. I you know I don't actually. So my workflow and just I've covered this before on the show uh, mm-hmm. is uh, I I don't want a full ISO image so mm-hmm. much as I want just the main video track and I don't even want like the subtitles. I don't want so I use uh, I use any DVD and make MKV mm-hmm. and that combo for me. Uh, has worked really well because I at the end what I want is a very high bit rate uh, X264 in an MKV container. I don't really want right. a full ISO Just image. Just the movie it's, is what you want. Because don't mm-hmm. you run into you mean like for example, can you use Plex with ISO images? No. Yeah. No, well, they they keep the, if you look on their website, they say that it technically supports it. I've never gotten it to work correctly. Um, but I, I, I use Plex mainly for TV shows and when I'm traveling. If I'm going to watch a movie, I put, we put a lot of money into a home theater that we have downstairs. If I'm going to watch a movie, I'm going to do it down there. And if mm-hmm. I'm going to do it down there, I have direct access to my file server yeah. where I have all of my ISOs. So transcoding, and, I wouldn't transcode anyway. And then one last, is, uh, one last question from the chat room. Uh, MS uh, Cernick asks, uh, Chris, why don't you use Handbrake to compress the Blu-rays? Uh, well, actually, Blu-ray is already compressed. In fact, it's a form of... Of H.264, I think it's like called AVC compression, right? I'm probably getting that wrong. It doesn't matter. Uh, it, it, so that is already a compressed video. So if you just take the, what is on a Blu-ray disc and wrap it in an MKV container with something like uh, Make MKV, then you have a compressed. You now it's very large, but you have a compressed mm-hmm. video file. Uh, and then you could use something like Handbrake to bring it down even further if you wanted to do so. Uh, all right, boy, we just that was like a that was a major spotlight. <laughs> a lot of video yeah, encoding. Yeah. So I hope people care about that. Uh, Noah, we have a really great spotlight this week. I'm really excited for the Corita project. Version 2.9 just came out. It's the uh, work from uh, eight months of coding, and it's the biggest Corita release ever. They say uh, it's also calling it the Kickstarter release. And maybe before we go too far, do we, should we bring that email in that we got here uh, sure. from a from a listener? Do you want to read that? I'll, uh, sure. I'll pull it yeah. up here. So we got a, yeah we got a feedback a piece of feedback in, and we decided to include it in the spotlight section. It says uh, this comes from us from Stephen. It says hello. I'm contacting you to see if there's any interest in interviewing somebody from the Creta team for last. Creta is nearing its biggest release ever and has shown what Kickstarter can mean for free free Libra open source software. Many of the features promised have been implemented and more are being prepared for a new round. I'm a member of both communities, Jupiter Broadcasting and Creta, and would find it awesome to see Creta represented on LAS in an interview or maybe a live demonstration if that can be achieved technically. I'm sure we can make something work. Yeah, uh, I think so too. And uh, 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 I think it was really nice of Stephen to send that in and, and give us a mouse. Uh, we could do an art-centric version of LAS coming up. We've done some little stuff in the past that we actually people did like. We did a photography-dedicated episode and we uh, brought Ian on and mm-hmm. he talked about that. Uh, so uh, there, you, Corita, uh, in fact, I believe, I was reading through the site, uh, 11 of the dozen new major features were all user requested. And mm-hmm. uh, that's really cool. Uh, and so now they so one of the big ones is you can open multiple documents in Corita and you can display them. You know, you could tile them or you can tab through them. Uh, so I don't really get the Kickstarter connection. I guess, are, are they doing funding on Kickstarter now? Is that what's happening? I think so, yeah. yeah. I think that uh, I, well, I th- that's how they got started, right? It's a beautiful, it is a really beautiful uh, QT drawing application. Uh, and they've got some uh, uh, HDR stuff in here that looks really cool, too. I'm bringing up the, uh, there's a, they have a, a painting, HDR painting demo, which, you know, HDR is the new hotness. Mm-hmm. So it starts with a black and white image here. And they're zooming in. And I'm going to jump ahead a little bit for uh, our Ready Bake uh, version here. Oh, wow. So then by the time he's, this is all, I mean, there, this is really genuinely art. When you see somebody drawing something like this, I, they're probably using a tablet, like a Wacom or something like that, mm-hmm. but it's kind of amazing. And this is all free open source software that works beautifully on Linux. So congratulations to the creative team. And if you've never played with it, you should probably go check it out. It's the latest version and uh, they're really super proud of it. Congratulations to them. I'm going to play around with it after the show and uh, talk about it some more later. I don't know if you ever play with it much, Noah. No, I. You know, I'm not much of a much of an art person. Yeah. I, I I I work with graphic tools to the point that yep. uh, when the people that I pay to do graphic design come to me and say, "Well, we have this SVG that yeah. um, needs to be put into a background, or I need to export it, or create it into a business card, or something like that," I'll, I'll monkey my way around. Yeah, but yep. I am by no means uh, a a graphic or artsy person. That's totally me so, too. That's I I have like barely I don't enough. Spend a lot mu- that much time in in that realm. Yeah, if I didn't have to do stuff for the network, I would never. Totally crashed, didn't it? Oh, 
Sorry, no. Well, here, while you, uh, while you take care of that, I'll mention uh, the fact that we have, uh, like, just mere days left. The uh, Teespring uh, t- uh, Tech Snap uh, shirt relaunched. Oh, go over to teespring.com slash techsnap2 hundy. And uh, it's got uh, till March 8th that we had, we had ended, but it, it actually relaunched again based on demand. That is the new Tech Snap logo. I'm just giving it a mention here because uh, people have been responding really well to it, and I haven't really promoted it very much. So I wanted to mention it right there, teespring.com slash techsnap, and you can get the new 200 logo. Techsnap, just, it's like a 204 now, but we, uh, we're we rolling out the brand new logo there. We have long sleeve shirts as well. And also, I'll give a quick plug for our picks. Go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash last picks for all of our previous picks, the runs Linux, the desktop picks, the spotlights, all of that. Producer Rotten Corpse keeps that up to date, and uh, you can also help contribute, and you can also fork it on GitHub. So if you've heard us talk about something in the past that uh, you're like, oh, what was it he mentioned? Because this is actually one of the number one questions we get into the show, was, hey, Chris, what was that desktop app pick you mentioned four weeks ago? Dude, they, they all run together. Like, I do not remember any of them. So you have to go over to the jupiterbroadcasting.com slash last picks. Don't ask me. I don't know. I would just go do a site search just like you would or check the pick site. So uh, go there. You'll find it. Also, if you're setting up a new rig, it's a great way to get a whole bunch of really good apps. All right. So uh, we'll go fix Noah's connection, and uh, that'll that'll be all the picks. So you know what that means. It's time for the news. Hey, it's the news, and this episode is brought to you by Ting.com. Go to last.ting.com to support the Linux Action Show and to get $25 off your first Ting device if you have a Ting-compatible device. And there's a lot more of them now. Well, then you'll get $25 service credit. And if you're like me, that'll pay for more than your first month of service. Here's why. Flat $6 per month for your line. It's just $6, and then your usage on top of that. Your minutes, your messages, your megabytes, whatever you use, that's what you pay and taxes and stuff and then you're done there's no contract those there's no so there's no early termination fee because there's no contract and the devices are unlocked so you're just using the service and paying for what you use with all kinds of features you'd come to expect like hotspot tethering three-way calling voice mail you know picture messaging and, and then some you would never expect like no hold customer service you can call them at 1-855-TING-FTW you get a real human being between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. east coast time And you can just ask them stuff. They're empowered to answer your question. They don't have to transfer you around. That's incredible. And then they also have an amazing dashboard that lets you manage all of this and some great apps that also help you manage it. So it's a very compelling setup. And if you go to last.ting.com, you'll get it on that discount. And right there on the front page, they have the savings calculator so you can see how much you would save. But Noah, sir, do you know what I love? Do you know what I love? I love what you love. I love I app hear picks. What you love. No, I love app picks. I love great applications. And the, this one this week is one that Chase and I use every single week. So we do the Unfilter show on Wednesdays, and Chase comes straight from work. And the show starts pretty much when he walks in the door, which can change a lot depending on traffic. I also use this when my wife is waiting to leave the house and needs me to watch the kids and I'm running behind. It's called Glimpse. And Kyrus, have you ever used Glimpse? Glimpse is awesome. Yeah. Kyra's here. She's going to rock Glimpse for us with the app pick. If you're not familiar with it, you're about to. Kyra, take it away. Never again be lost for an answer to the age-old question, where you at? I'm Kyra, and this Ting's App of the Week. If you've ever tried to get a group of people together for a shared activity, you know it can be like herding cats. If you've ever asked someone, how far away are you on the phone? If you've ever tried to get friends to meet at a new, unfamiliar spot, you need Glimpse. Glimpse lets you share your location on a map, but for a limited amount of time and only with people you specifically choose. So I can send a glimpse, choose who I want to share my location with, for how long, and also tell friends where I'm going. Clicking on View Map, you can see everyone you're currently connected with on Glimpse, how fast they're going, and how near they are to your shared destination. Other location sharing services can be like a jealous boyfriend or girlfriend, always wanting to know where you are and who you're with. Glimpse is more like a life partner, helpful when asked, but also willing to give you a space without you having to ask for it. Glimpse is available for free on Android, iOS, and Windows Phone. Links are in the description below. Thanks for watching, and see you next week. Go to last.ting.com to get started. Last.ting.com. And don't forget, last.ting.com is a good way to get started, but then once you're a Ting customer, they also have a pretty awesome referral program where uh, you'll be, I think you'll be pretty impressed with uh, the kind of savings you can get through the referral program. And then last but not least, they've been talking about it. They've been doing the beta test. It's now in open beta, Ting on GSM. You can now get a Ting GSM device 
and uh, they got more all the time. You can bring your own, which means there's a whole new class of devices you can bring over. And uh, I'm talking to a friend of mine, and uh, he's using the new GSM network to, to power a set of security devices. He has some remote uh, location security devices that have really good uh, Ting GSM coverage. And since Ting's only pay for what you use, and these devices only send reports from time to time, instead of him having to pay on, on some sort of large, like a huge prepay account or some large monthly fee, he put the Ting GSMs in these devices and has them on the Ting GSM network. And when the devices need to send reports, he just pays for the data they use. It's a really cool setup. And maybe I'll tell you more about it soon. Go to last.ting.com to get started. And uh, now, better than ever, last.ting.com. Go check them out. And a big thanks to Ting for sponsoring the Linux Action Show. Hey, Noah, guess what? Friends of the show, the Ubuntu Mate project, have some really good news this week. Ubuntu Mate is now an official flavor of the Ubuntu project. Uh, of course, uh, we talk to uh, Wimpy and Popey all the time on Linux Unplugged. So if you're a Mate desktop user, especially of the Ubuntu variety here, and you don't listen to Unplugged, you're missing out on a bunch of behind-the-scenes information. Like right now, they're focusing in on a new release. They have a new beta out based on 1504. And Noah, ready for this? You ready? I'm ready? It's got out of the box one click shiny. One click shiny turn on comp is under mate. Huh? Not bad, right? They have a, and they're also expanding their power PC support and now they're an official Ubuntu flavor. So it is real and, and they're really growing in popularity too. Uh, so uh, getting official flavor status doesn't cause really much differences, I guess, for us. The noticeable change is that Ubuntu Mate download images are now being hosted on the B main Ubuntu image server, so they get access to all that good canonical bandwidth. And behind the scenes, there's benefits to the official community flavor status, like uh, you can get uh, access to canonical, canonical's infrastructure for automated building, test dis uh, distributing, including the creation of daily images, and now the power of PC spin. So that's really good news for them internally. It's going to help make that stuff a lot easier. It's a good infrastructure you get when you become an official flavor. Congrats, you know, guys. Ubuntu Mate has become, or Mate, I should say, uh, Ubuntu Mate has become one of those de facto distributions for me. So, um, you know, anytime we go into a, a client location and they and we're going to transition them to Linux, still, quite honestly, it's it's still just plain old Ubuntu. But I've gotten to the point where anytime I'm using uh, older hardware, um, it, Ubuntu Mate, I understand, is actually lighter weight than LXDE, uh, than XFCE. Um, and I, I heard it, and I didn't quite believe it at first, but after playing with it, I was using it on a couple Pentium 4s that uh, I wanted to repurpose. And it, they were, it works great. Really? Pentium 4s? Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty yeah, good. Yeah, <laughs> they have 256 megs of RAM, and they're running. The, and the nice thing is, I don't necessarily need a fancy, snappy desktop UI to get some of the. If I'm using, like, for example, if I'm streaming VLC, and I and I want to do that, uh, it, it may be in the command line, but I want a couple of the GUI tools so I can run TeamViewer to remotely access the machine or something like that. I don't necessarily need full-on Unity, but I need some sort of a desktop environment. I don't need, but it's nice to have. Yeah, and that's a bunch of Mate fits right in there, and it, and it works great. It br breathes life back into to new machines, and I have the laptop that's mounted inside of my car now. I, I, uh, I Hold on, the, the laptop that's mounted where? In my car, uh -huh. in, okay. in my truck. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So yeah. everyone doesn't have one of those? So your truck runs Linux? My, tr <laughs> my truck runs Linux. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, but yeah, it, that, I've started using Ubuntu Mate for that, and that has been, it again, it's that's an old uh, that's I think it's a core two duo and again totally uh, totally refreshed and it, I mean it ran Unity but it chugged now yeah, yeah, yeah. it's snappy fast yeah that's so nice I'm a huge fan of the uh, a bunch uh, of the tape and that's why they're that's why they're getting so much adoption in uh, amongst the Power PC users who have like old Macs mm -hmm. but also like other stations that built around Power PC. Uh, they're actually pretty good systems. They're really well built and the Power PC architecture is pretty clever. And so you t you throw Ubuntu. Uh, mate or Mata or Mate or Mate on there, uh, and mate. You, you get you know essentially what feels like a brand new computer again because it's so performant. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to shift gears and talk about uh, something that Dan Gilmore wrote on Medium. Uh, Dan Gilmore, he's been in media, and he's written for newspapers, online books. He's, Dan Gilmore's been around for a really really long time. And uh, he wrote a uh, pretty long article uh, saying why I'm saying goodbye to Apple, Google, and Microsoft. When I became a technology columnist in the mid-1990s, the public Internet was just beginning in its big first surge. Back then, I advised my readers to avoid semi-political, even religious battles that advocates of this or that technology platform seem to enjoy. I appreciate technology. I urged for what is a tool and used what works best. So why am I typing this on a laptop running GNU slash Linux? 
the free software operating system, not Apple or a Windows machine? Because first of all, I get my work done fine. I can play games. I can surf endlessly. The platform alternatives have reached a stage where they're capable of handling just about anything I need. More important, I've moved to these alternative platforms because I've changed my mind about the politics of technology. I now believe it is essential to embed my instincts and values to a greater extent in the technology that I use. Those values start with this basic notion. We are losing control over the tools that once promised equal opportunity in speech and innovation. And this has to stop. Control is moving back to the center, where powerful companies and governments are creating choke points. They are using those choke points to destroy our privacy, limit our freedom of expression, and lock down culture and commerce. Too often we give them our permission, trading liberty for convenience. But a lot of this is being done without our knowledge, much less our permission. Uh, he says, I'm not trying to be paranoid here. I'm emulating in tech, in the tech sphere, some of the principles that have led so many to adopt slow food or vegetarian lifestyles or to minimize their carbon footprint or to do business only with socially responsible companies. Nor do I intend to preach, but if I can persuade even a few of you to join me, even in some small ways, I'll be thrilled. And then one, there's, this is a really long article, lots of history, uh, one last bit. In fact, here's a, uh, if you're curious, uh, boop, boop, right there is a shot of uh, his Unity desktop running on Ubuntu. He talks a little bit about that. That'll be linked in the article if you want to read it. But there's one last point that resonated with me. He says, I've given up on the idea that free software and open hardware will become the norm for consumers anytime soon, if ever. Even though free and open source software is at the heart of the Internet's back end, if two people are willing to try, though, the default will win, and the defaults are Apple, Google, and Microsoft. And so here's a few things I took away from this. A, in, in embedding my values into the technology that I use, because it's supposed to be a tool that enhances my life, so embedding my values into that is important. And, and the other thing I took away from that is if the people who are in positions to use the software don't use it, a.k.a. if, if an open source solution is out there, and it can do everything you need, but you opt to use something else. The, if, we, if, those people, if the people that can don't opt to use that software, then it will fade away, and all we'll have left is the commercial solution. And that's really powerful. And then the last powerful notion was, even if, even if only a small minority ever use desktop Linux, it's still a super, super important thing that's out there that helps keep leverage against the default from taking over everything. And so even if the de desktop Linux is, is somewhere between 0.05% and 10% for the rest of its existence, it's still playing a super critical role. And I thought that was, he, even, even though I, these are reasons I've used Linux for a really long time, like Dan was able to sort of put it into words for me. Did any of it really resonate with you? You know, honestly, I'll start. I'll start. I'll work backwards a little bit. I'll start out by saying that I'm inclined to disagree with him. And if you share the sentiment, then with you, that that uh, free and open source software will never become the the standard, if not, if ever, uh, certainly not soon. I, I disagree with that, and I, and I disagree with that for a number of reasons. The 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 I think the primary one being people, in my experience, don't make software decisions themselves. For the most part, I don't see a lot of people organically uh, uh, googling best note taking software and 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 getting a list of note taking software and then trying them all and then eventually settling with Evernote. What I find <laughs> right. is people are sitting at work and somebody taps them on the shoulder and says, hey, you know that I see what you're doing there. There's a better thing. You should be using Evernote. Yeah. That's a lot better. Or a boss says, this is what we're going to mm -hmm. deploy company-wide because he heard about it from mm -hmm. one of his colleagues. Mm -hmm. And where that change begins, where it starts is with people like us, the IT support people, the, I, the people that come in and talk to a general manager who cares nothing about what software his employees are using. Really, all he cares about is what's the cost going to be and how does he get the job done. And I come in and say something, and I have the, I, I can go one of two approaches, or three really. I can say we can use Google Docs, we can use LibreOffice, or we can use Microsoft Office. And then I give them the pros and cons, and then eventually they make a decision, and then it's forced upon everyone else. And then it creates a cycle because they get comfortable with it, they get familiar with those tools and and then the cycle perpetuates and what i'm seeing is at a rapid pace at an alarming rapid pace 
people are moving towards open source software because the people that are making the, that are influencing those decisions are playing with free and open source stuff because they do know what to care about or they do know to care about freedom or they do care about right. even if they don't care about freedom and, they care about the security. And, uh, in that article, Dan talks about how uh, he's like, you know, when I need to use word processing, I use LibreOffice. And his mm -hmm. t here's his attitude on. He says LibreOffice not as shiny as Microsoft Office. Doesn't matter at all. Does everything I need. Um, and I'm not trying to downplay how uh, op if open source is pleasant or not to use. Like Bracero, for example, mm -hmm. is a very lovely application. Beautiful design. Works very clearly. Mm -hmm. uh, LibreOffice, you know, it it's, works very nice. Not the best mm -hmm. design. Enterprise applications almost universally have always had horrible UI. Uh, you know, like right. I was just at uh, Best, uh, no, Fry's yesterday. Mm -hmm. Dude, they're still using freaking Windows XP. And then on Windows XP, for all the, for all the checkout terminals, they're bringing up mm -hmm. a text mainframe terminal. They don't care yeah. about UI at all in the enterprise. Yeah. Functionality, mm -hmm. cost, manageability mm -hmm. are like the, to number, the top three things. And right. Open source, like a lot of this, these solutions, have gotten to the point where they mm -hmm. fit those categories really well. But I, I would submit to you that even in the realm of UIs and looking pretty, I would I would submit to you that we are making we are making exponential process sure, sure. ever ever quickly. And, yeah. and I say that, and I can defend that position relatively well by saying things like, I had a customer a couple weeks ago that confused LibreOffice with an Apple product. I had just uh, uh, last <laughs> yeah, week right. when yep. I was at yep. scale, I was talking to the guys from the elementary OS, and he was talking about, and you'll see this in the interview when they play it, how they modify, how they spent time an effort to round the corners of the display because the way that the laptop renders the, you know, you get those sharp lines and he didn't like it. He thought it should be a rounded corner. So they spent time to, to round the corners out, uh, you know, of the desktop and, and stuff like that. Small, tiny little changes. There's a handful of people. I mean, one in a thousand that's ever going to look at the desktop and go, you know, the corners of my desktop are rounded. They're not, uh, they're not square. They don't fit against the monitor anymore. How many people would notice that? Seriously, I wouldn't. Um, and But we have people like that in the community now that are taking the time and effort to make those changes, to make things that much, you know, prettier. Mm -hmm. And as that as that happens, uh, I think that I think that that paradigm is going to change that 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 mentality of, oh, it's free and open source. It might be functional, but it's just not going to look as nice as the proprietary yep. solutions. I think not only is it going to change, I think it's going to I think yeah. it's going to surpass yeah. what proprietary software. Yeah, I, I don't necessarily agree with Dan either. I think uh, in a lot of ways, open source will become the default more and more as time goes mm -hmm. on. And I've said this a long time. I think if you look at the long mm -hmm. if you look at the long term trajectory of things, these commercial companies, they just can't stand anything for more than 10 years and then they have to go chase a new shiny. Uh, whereas the open mm -hmm. source just continues to slowly grow organically and eventually... And don't get me... Oh, go ahead. Don't get me wrong. I like the article, but I do find it a little comical that he's saying this is why I made these choices, but I don't believe anyone else is going to follow my same footsteps. Well, I kind of, right? I mean, I think people won't make those choices for those reasons. Uh, I don't think a lot of people will. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, all right. Next story. You ready? Any other thoughts? I'm ready. Okay. Uh, good news. XFCE 4.1.2 has been released after two years and 10 months. They have this brand new release out. They say, look, uh, and I, I love it, like right out of the gate, blowing a little smoke here, Noah. Just blowing a little smoke. Check this out. Check this line out. Uh, the long period between releases can only be explained by how awesome XFCE 4.10 was. That's why I was delayed. It was just so awesome. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's a little smoke. I, I mean, here's, uh, yeah. I mean, here's the thing. I, uh, XFCE and I just don't get along. Well, okay, um, check this out. You have a new themable alt tab switcher. Uh, the panel is now a little more intelligent. It can hide itself, supports GTK3 mm -hmm. plugins. Uh, the desktop has new wallpaper settings dialog, uh, workspace wallpaper support, better multi monitor handling, big improvements there. Uh, session, ma session manager was updated to use login D or whatever you know is in the back end. Uh, power management was not forgotten, and lots of plugins created there. Uh, new file manager updates, uh, tons of improvements into Thonar tab support, bug fixes, speed up keys, key shortcuts, GTK bookmarks, three support. I mean, all this stuff, and I want to show you some images too of it. Here's the new switcher. It looks real, real nice. Here's an alternative one. Or you can do big window thumbnails. This is, dude, look at this. This is straight up like fancy-ass functionality in XFCE with these big uh, tiles generated during the alt tab here. Uh, here is uh, client-side decoration support for GTK applications. So now with XFCE, you can support client-side decoration. So here is an example of uh, gedit. 
Um, you can now uh, drag uh, drag a window up to the corner to tile it. It'll snap. High DPI support has been much improved with this version of X- XFCE. Uh, That's cool. Lots of nice improvements here. Lots of really That's nice cool. improvements. The, the high, high DPI appeals to me because I've said this once and I'll say it again. I think that 2015 is going to be the year of high DPI monitors. But here is my here's where I come down on F- XFCE is... It, I don't think XFCE looks as nice as Mate, and I don't see what it offers me over Mate. Yeah, I do agree. I mean, Mate is just the. Uh, it seems to have more momentum behind it. It seems to be, and the other thing, especially when you combine it with the Ubuntu Mate project, where they're mm-hmm. where they're sort of uh, even further polishing off the rough rough edges, adding like you know a better menu mm-hmm. system, uh, easier mm-hmm. uh, um, virtual desktop effects, and you know compass fanciness, those kinds of things. Yeah, uh, it's it's and good. It, it's competition. It, it, Six months ago, I would have told you that XFC was a lighter weight desktop, so if you needed something with less power, use it. But I have recently been told by people that know a lot more about it than me that Mate is actually lighter weight than XFC, and I'll admit that in practice, I found the same thing to be true. Ooh. Things that XFC has trouble with, Mate flies on. Seems so, like... And I'd like to Mate see, I'd, looking uh, nicer than XFC. Sorry, I, I would like to see somebody in the audience test that. I would like to see... I mean, I know you've tested mm-hmm. it, but I'd like to see some other... Because I, yeah. I wonder if it's specific to the setup you're using or... Curious. Yeah, and on all of my tests, admittedly, all of my tests are empirical. I don't have any. I've I've not benchmarked anything. I haven't installed it on on. I I've simply installed XFCE and it didn't work very well. And I installed Ubuntu Mate. And and admittedly, there are a thousand other things that could probably be influencing why I've had better experience. But I will say this: it's not just one or two or three times. I I've done it on seven or eight machines, and I have consistently found mm. that Ubuntu Mate performs better than mm. XFC on uh, uh, XFC on Ubuntu on all of those machines all right enough so, enough about these lightweight desktops this is our last news story i want to talk about gnome and then we'll get out of here this is a real desktop i mean i'm just saying right i mean I, i'm just saying uh gnome 3.16 is going to be out soon and uh boy is it looking how uh it should be shipping on march 25th now i don't know when that means it'll hit any distributions that we can actually use number one feature i'm the most excited about Goodbye to the message tray. Like right now, see down here, these are my message notifications down here. You can see I got like all this stuff going on. <clears throat> that mm-hmm. crap down there that you forget about all the time is now going to be stuffed in the calendar drop down menu. Ooh, yeah. I like that. Yeah, and you can clear I like them that individually. Because hitting the super M key to super key M to get down to that notification thing, I don't know how you launch it. I always hit super key M. Um, I fondle is, the bottom. It, I fondle it. I fondle. You fondle the bottom. Yeah, yeah, but it never. But so, so really, what you're saying is you're at the same place I was. You don't really know how to bring it up. No, I mean, I, I, I basically just fondle it until it works, and then once I, yeah, yeah it's uh, right. That's how I did it with the mouse until somebody told me to use the keyboard shortcut, which yeah. I do because it's more reliable. Yeah. But this makes much more sense. Number one, number two, I never understood why do I want to go to two different and totally opposite sides of the screen to get my information. I have to go to the very top of the screen to get my calendars or my widgets or logouts or all of that stuff, and then I go to the bottom to get notifications. Why aren't they all in the same place? I never. Yeah, made sense I mean, I do kind of like the, the slick, I do kind of like the slick slide up of the notification, but other than that, yeah. the slide up part is cool. But why? So, for example, I can see it for certain things. Like, for instance, own cloud. I don't necessarily need to see that it's the little icon that says it's in sync. I um, unless something changes, uh, it can just reside down there, and or, or my instant messenger client I don't necessarily need to see that but there's a lot of the a lot of things that I do want to see what's going on and those notification things are hidden mm-hmm. until I bring that little drawer up mm-hmm. which you can use is not easy to do you can use the top icons extension uh, I yeah I have that and yeah but but if I'm using an extension to modify something then I, then essentially what I'm saying is I don't like yeah. the desktop the way it is and no this is a way better solution <laughs> this is a way this is I this agree. is yeah uh, and they've also done a bunch of improvements to the uh, Edwadia GTK theme. Notifications uh, are going to look slick with that. Uh, the privacy control panel, uh, it's nice. It's clean. It's straightforward. And uh, now you can quickly opt out of reporting bugs and geolocation tracking. And I've actually gotten uh, a number of questions from the audience about how to turn off geo services in GNOME. So this has mm-hmm. obviously been something users have been looking for. So they've put it right there. Uh, Nautilus or fi- Nautilus or files, bunch of uh, little improvements here and there. The uh, gear menu has been uh, revi- revised into a popover menu, just means it looks nicer and using the, some of the new GTK fanciness. Uh, there's also a new undo delete feature. Let's see, I have a screenshot of it here. So uh, here's a so here's an example of uh, these the notifications now along the top of the screen there, Noah. And mm-hmm. when you delete something in files, the the same thing kind of pops up in the file manager. 
the same little uh, undo option now comes up. It's sort of a little transparent overlay that comes up at the top of the file manager there where you can undo delete actions. You know, here's uh, here's my initial impression of that. Have you ever had Unity where you get the, uh, the, the HUD pops down and gives you a, a notification and you want to click under it and you click on it and then yeah. it just like goes kind of they want they're not going to they're not going to do that they won't do that okay they're, 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 good yeah. no they're good uh also just the other, other thing oh go ahead there's, there's other improvements no, i was going to say the other I'll thing i wish would change about gnome that yeah. is not, probably not going to change because it was a very intentional uh a uh, uh, functionality uh -huh. but i despise the fact that i have to hold control when i delete something oh yeah i think you can change that in gconf can you? Yeah, I think you can go in there. It's really irritating. Yeah. Also, and I understand that they did it intentionally, but Jacob still wants us to mention that i3 just hit version 4.9. Boom. So there's some Woo. desktop coverage for you. Also, Plasma's great. So there, I feel like we've covered a lot of bases with that one. I <laughs> got yeah, everybody yeah, happy. Yeah. How, many, how many are left? <laughs> yeah. We have to talk about X Mode Ad yeah. and Awesome, and I think we got the, the whole set. <laughs> yeah. One of these days, we are going to have to probably seriously consider, even though it's not neither your nor my preference, I think we're going to have to I sit know. down, buckle down, and do a, a tiling window manager I know. I know. review. I know. I know. Yeah. All right. Wait, oh, and Enlightenment 19. Yeah, there we go. Got that in there, too. All right, Noah. Well, that's all the news for this week. But well, we're all back from Scale 13X, and we have some fantastic exclusive interviews from the floor. I cannot wait to play them for you. First, I want to tell you about our segment sponsor, and that's System76. Go over to System76.com right now. These are computers designed to run Linux, which means you're not going to hassle with drivers or getting your wireless to work or fiddling with your webcam. No, all that stuff works out of the box and I use Arch. You could they ship with Ubuntu 14.04 or 14.10, depending on your choice, which means you can get that great LTS release, which has been more and more popular these days. Tons of great laptops, like uh, right there, you're looking at the Ultra Pro with this high res, nice, beautiful IPS 1080p display. But you guys know me, I like the horsepower. They have some great desktops built right here in the US of A, like the Leopard Extreme. This is a beautiful, water-cooled rig, and System76 is offering $200 off right now on the Leopard Extreme. So go quick while this is still going. If you've been thinking about getting a Leopard Extreme, it's, the, it's just uh, such an amazing machine with quad-channel DDR4 memory, hot-swappable drive, solid-state storage. It really is. And it's all of that, and it's quite, quite quiet, too, for how much horsepower is in there. System76.com. Go get yourself a great machine that runs Linux and tell them the Linux Action Show sent you. Hey, Noah, speaking of Linux, so Scale 13, the first conference really where we were able to do the whole thing end-to-end -end using Linux, you and William went down to Scale, and uh, you had, what, not, not a lot of gear, but all Linux gear, yeah? All Linux gear. So we'll start out back at the studio. We, of course, use the System76 Wild Dog to get the feed. That's what you're getting right now. Um, but when we went down to scale, I had the opportunity to meet Carl and the entire team at System76, which was really fun because I got to put some faces to mm -hmm. some names. I often get support from System76. Of course, they have amazing support, and they they give you support even after the industry standard warranty expires on the computer. And so I have been in contact with uh, with people like Ian um, that I've seen his name I've, and I've seen his avatar pop up, but I've never actually uh, I've never actually seen his face, and I never actually have had the opportunity yeah. to meet him. Yeah. And of course, it, uh, in addition to meeting him, I was able to uh, bamboozle him into putting the live stream onto that amazing looking screen of the Ultra Galago. Yeah, that was awesome. So that uh, everyone could watch the stream while we were doing the stream. That was really slick. That was that's in mm -hmm. the uh, live stream special, and you get to see Noah go back there and bamboozle the Ubuntu booth. Well, while we're talking about System Seventy Six. Why don't we start with our first interview? You actually got a chance to talk to System76 CEO, Carl Richel, and uh, that's where we'll start with our scale interviews. So winding out the day at Scale 2015, Scale 13X, um, when you come across giants in the Linux community like Linus Torvalds or Carl Richel, you have to stop and say hello. So I, I, was, I was very fortunate, very pleased to meet, uh, to meet Carl, shake his hand, and personally thank him for all the work that he's done over at System76. Carl, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. It's uh, very generous. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, don't, so, I don't know if I'm quite on the same level but, but, uh, by any means. But well, so Lin nice. Linus himself said that he thinks that the focus of Linux should be on the desktop. Mm -hmm. and. I, I'd, I'd be hard pressed to think in my head of a person that has done more to promote Linux on the desktop than System76, right? I mean, you guys have really, you guys have really pushed that. I'm interested. What things are going on at System76 right now? 
Uh, well, today we're working on new products. So we've got fifth generation Intel products coming out in just about a month. Mm -hmm. uh, new laptop, we're working on two desktops. Uh, one's a workstation, the other one is a, a super compact desktop. Mm -hmm. So the, the product line is expanding. Mm -hmm. uh, we've also grown quite a bit over the last year. So uh, we have a lot more people that are contributing to graphic design and uh, front-end web development and uh, DevOps. And mm -hmm. uh, so the company itself becoming more efficient and we're able to produce more products. So uh, it's exciting times ahead. We're, and we're offering LTS as long as alongside uh, the standard Ubuntu release, so more options for our customers. Now, I, uh, I run a small business, and I've been a System76 customer for a long time, and one of the things that I've noticed, the big change, is you have brought Sam on, and Sam is there to kind of help push along the businesses. That's right, yeah, so now we have actually enterprise sales and we have consumer sales, so yeah. as the company's grown, well, we're able to focus um, our, you know, the, the talent within the company towards individual customers and, and the needs of those customers. So it's, uh, it, it's an exciting time. Would you say that uh, would would you say that desktop Linux is becoming uh, a more and more practical for for a lot of people where that just hadn't been a solution in the past uh, due to application constraints? I think that might be due to the internet more so than anything right. else. Uh, yeah. You know, proliferation of internet services and being able to do most of the things that you need on the internet means the operating system is less important. So you yes. can go for something that is more secure or easier to use rather than lock in from a, a software vendor on, on shrink wrapped software. Absolutely. And you, you guys have been so attached to uh, Canonical and Ubuntu uh, essentially at the hip. Um, How's, have, how have the changes that they've been making, how has that uh, impacted or, or, or crafted your decision or, or have you just, uh, you're just kind of along for the ride whatever, wherever that goes? Well, in certain respect, we're along for the ride, but um, we still like to take a holistic approach to our products. Yes. So it, it matters that you know the quality of Ubuntu is a reflection of the quality of our own products as well. Mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, we have a, a lot of trust in the work of the engineers that are canonical because yeah. they do amazing work. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it's been a, a good relationship and a strong relationship, and and we're we're excited about the things they're building today. Unity 8 and Mirror and the phone and, mm -hmm. and convergence. Uh, it's going to give us the opportunity to build more unique products. So it's a uh, uh, it's only. Are the relationships only growing with the with the, the uh, differentiation that Ubuntu is producing within their project? Absolutely. Now, with the um, with with the product line that you offer currently, is there any chance of a 13-inch laptop? No. <laughs> okay, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, however, there, uh, we are working to make our, our products more accessible to people. Okay. So we're going to be uh, offering and, and launching products at lower price points uh, really? to, to compete with. Uh, uh, well, we can't get down to Chromebook yeah, prices. Right, right. Uh, you know, uh, what it's, we wouldn't be able to produce a high-quality yeah. product then. Mm -hmm. uh, but we will be more competitive and uh, and reach um, uh, high-quality products at lower prices for people too. And, and I'm always one of those people, I'd rather spend a couple extra dollars and get something worth my money than, than get a computer for two or three hundred bucks but it doesn't perform well. And every System system, system 76 computer that I have, and I've bought a couple of them, they're all still running like the day I bought them. I've never had a problem with them. I take that back, I had a problem with the wireless card once, but you guys sent me a brand new one, a uh, brand new one, and no problems at all, and it, it's, it's the support is fantastic. So that, that, that has really helped. Um, have you uh, have you been following the Librem 15 and, and have you taken a look at that and seen how that uh, what uh, how System 76 how that affects you guys? Oh well, I think uh, it's the more people that are advocating open source and freedom in computing, the better. Yeah. So uh, I wish those guys the best of luck and I hope the project works out well. Yeah. And you know that's see that's the difference between somebody like you and and the people that like Dell or Lenovo is they're they're in it at the I mean you have to put money on your table to, to eat so naturally I mean you have a you have a vested interest in self preservation at the same time. You're willing to say, listen, the community is more important than me, and I, I think that's what sets you above, you know, one notch above uh, most of those other companies. I think that's why people frequent places like System76 is because you're going to get that that one-on-one -on -one connection with somebody who really cares about desktop Linux and really cares about the community. How about a Linux tablet? Is anything like that on the horizon? Uh, we're just waiting for an operating system. All right. Hey, uh, All right. And a bunch of seems like they got some demos right there. So, so we're close then. It's getting close. Yeah. Outstanding. Now, uh, another aspect I wanted to talk about, and I actually brought this up. Out on the air, um, I think my very first episode with Jupiter Broadcasting was, I have been a remarkably happy customer of Beanbooks. And uh, we switched from, from Inuit and had a little bit of problems towards the end of the year. And who's the guy that runs Beanbooks that helps with support? Uh, well, David A. Overcash is yes. the primary engineer. Okay, so David, David, my, uh, the, my accountant, uh, reached out to him and said, this, these are the problems that we're having. And with uh, like 
20 minutes, even at like nine o'clock at night. I mean, you, do you have them on like 24 hour call? So, all right, now the fascinating thing about that, this is the beauty of open source. So Beansbooks isn't technically open source, it's open code. Okay. Uh, however, uh, you're actually talking to the engineer, the primary platform engineer of the product. Yeah. So, uh, and that's the beauty of open source, I think in yeah. general. I mean, when you reach out and you get on a mailing list, you're talking to the people that are actually developing the software right. and can make a difference for you. And he did, he made a difference in 24 hours. In 24 hours, they had pushed some, they had made some change that fixed the problem that we were having and, and it was gone. And I, I looked right at, because there were, you, you might imagine that I, I, I was met with some resistance when I said I want to dump QuickBooks and I want to go to this other product. And, well, how long has it been out? Well, actually, it's kind of still technically in a, in a testing thing, but it, trust me, that's where we're going to go. And you should have seen the look on her face when I said, now tell me that Inuit would do the same thing. You know, I mean, that's the kind of support you get. So um, if somebody was interested in purchasing a System76 laptop or signing up for Beans Books, where would they go? All right, System76 is System76.com and Beans Books is BeansBooks.com. Man, Noah, how how hard would you buy a System76 tablet when it ships? Like, I would pre-order one sight unseen just because that sounds like a, such a perfect opportunity for somebody who's been shipping Ubuntu stuff that really gets the Ubuntu right. community, really gets the project. If they could land on some really good hardware, which would be the key piece, but if they could land on mm -hmm. some good hardware, I'd try it out. The only thing that would stop me from that is if they didn't ship actual Ubuntu, if they shipped Ubuntu Touch. Which I know seems obvious to most people, but I, I want an actual desktop operating system I bet, on the tablet. I bet there's a way you could make one become the other. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure. But that, that's what I'd really like to see. And that's, I think that's what System76 does the best is they have they – they, the, the thing that I like about Carl and the thing I like about System76 is they are so focused on Linux on the desktop. It does it, – it, it, Carl – looks at everything in that in how do we make Linux the norm how do we make Ubuntu specifically obviously the norm um, and and he he evaluates his opportunity and his success uh, on how many people are running uh, Linux on 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 the desktop mm -hmm. and that is something that I can see I can agree with him on a hundred percent and it's it's it is a it's a motivation that I can really get behind so if that transitions into a tablet, then I think that's going to be amazing. And I think if mm -hmm. it was System76 and Ubuntu, I think it would be an amazing experience. And uh, um, <clears throat> I also like the hints of uh, maybe some new hardware. All right. Yeah, so, but no 13-inch. Uh, no, yeah. Boy, he gave you a yeah. straight answer on that one. Like, you're yeah. like, boom, no. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, all right. So what, if you watched our whole coverage, you might see, you might have seen this. I've condensed down an interview that Noah got. I, I was super uh, uh, impressed with the passion from the Firefox booth at scale. I mean, they are there to push Firefox OS. Maybe the BQ phone might have sold like crazy, but they are repping Firefox OS uh, at scale. So uh, here's uh, interv the interview that Noah had with them. We're here on the floor at Scale 2015, walking around. I came across the Firefox booth. Now, I've been here a couple different times because these ladies are busy. This is a popular table, probably because they are demoing the Firefox phone. Not only are they demoing the Firefox phone, but when I asked if I could buy it, they said no, but we might give you one. So you can sign up to win a Firefox home phone. I put my information into the box, which they assure me will be shredded. They don't care if you use a disposable email address because Liz, the privacy ninja here, for Firefox, she uh, she has she has assured me that they t that Firefox takes your privacy very seriously. Isn't that correct? You. Absolutely. As long as you check your disposable email, so we can get a hold of you, doesn't matter what you give us. So tell me about some of the other things that you're doing to respect people's privacy at the conference. Okay, at the conference specifically, we're not. You can't really see. We're not scanning badges because that is a lot of personal information that you don't want me to have. Yeah, it is. Um, but also we're talking to people about uh, different privacy tools you can use like Lightbeam and Do Not Track. And my brain is... <laughs> Get button. Thank you. <laughs> no, I mean the, the the reality is that in in a world that is becoming so web centric, where all of our applications are running on the web, privacy becomes a huge concern. And so the fact that Mozilla takes the initiative to be proactive, your business cards, you cross out all of your contact information. <laughs> I do. It's partly a joke, but I bet you don't get many emails though. Many spam. Um, I don't. I, do, I don't get a lot of spam. I don't get a lot of scams either. Yeah. My information is fairly protected. 
That is excellent. I, I think that's very cool. And uh, I understand that not only are you guys interested in promoting Firefox, but you're running it on Linux. Yeah, actually on my MacBook over here, I have Ubuntu running because I'm not too big on Mac OS and proprietary stuff. It's it scares me. So as as per tradition, as soon as I found out that she had a MacBook, I immediately launched into my give her crap spiel. But she had a very good reason for having a MacBook. So my back is really messed up and the MacBook Air is only two and a half pounds. And because it's only two and a half pounds, I don't really you know, it doesn't hurt when I'm running around traveling. So it she was got, not her a ThinkPad. Yeah, and she got it as a gift from her grandpa, so I won't hold it against you that you're running. And you're running Linux on it, and yeah. that's really what's important at the end of the day, right? It's a native boot. It is. And and is macOS on there too, or is it nope. just... macOS is gone. Nope. It's all off. So I'd say that's about as good as anyone could possibly ask for. Now, I know the big, th big ticket item here is the Firefox phone. Uh, would any of the three of you like to talk about what the Firefox phone is, what it does? I've got mine here. Um, so this is the Firefox OS Flame. And what we did is we took the Android kernel and we used our rendering framework, Gecko. We built a Gecko layer over top of the Android kernel, and over top of that is our UI layer, Gaia. And they actually get flashed separately when you flash them via Fastboot, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, as, far as, the, uh, as far as the applications on Firefox OS, um, what kind of app store is available, or what do I need to run applications on the, on the phone? Okay, so we have our marketplace, and we don't have a hugely large um, ecosystem yet. We're still building it, but it's in the thousands right now, and we have a lot of big ticket names in there, like we have a Facebook app, we have a Twitter app, um, we have Cut the Rope, <laughs> and a couple of other really fun games. Uh, the Don't Touch the Black, the Don't Touch the White Tile game. We have one of those. So we're building it, and we need people. So if you're watching it, I want you to build a Firefox OS app. And I think that Firefox OS really is where it's at when it comes to true freedom and open source. I think I think that has that's what gives it a, a, a you know a leg up on the rest of the competition. I know you guys are busy, so I'm going to let you get back to, to presenting to all these people that want to see your phone and, and talk to you, ladies. Um, but is there anything else that either of you'd like to add, a plug, or or somewhere people can get more information about Firefox? Uh, not about Firefox, but we're um, asking people to sign a petition about net neutrality. So yeah. if you want to fight for net neutrality, come over. We will we'll have a form for you to fill it in. Uh, I think there's five days left. Tell Congress to leave our web alone. Or the lizards will bite them. We will bite you. They will. And they're, they're, they're very feisty. So. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us. We really appreciate it. Yeah. That was a good one, and I love I love Firefox. They're always at these events now, like totally repping. Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, I, that, I so I, the MacBook discussion was was pretty funny. No, you think that was bad? You should have seen how lively it was before I turned the camera. <laughs> uh, you can imagine what it was like if when I walked up and I'm like, "Really, Mozilla? You have a MacBook here? Is that a <laughs> joke?" But uh, but okay, let let's def let's define something while we're on that topic. Okay. Honestly, if she wipes Mac OS totally off of it, how different is it? How different is it from a ThinkPad? I mean. Yeah, other than just more Windows, trouble, the Mac OS ships. Yeah, huh? it's maybe more trouble. It's more trouble, but it is she? I mean, at the end of the day, she is using only Lin like the people that dual boot Linux and yeah. Mac OS. Yeah. I have come to believe, and I don't care what anyone tells me anymore. I I don't believe them. If you dual boot Mac OS and Win and and Linux for the most part, I'm yeah. just going to assume that you spend the majority <laughs> of your time in Mac OS, except when you're at a conference and you don't want to get made fun of, so you reboot into 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 Linux, and, and that that means absolutely nothing to me. But if she wiped Mac OS off of her laptop, that means she has yeah. zero interest yeah. in Apple or the Apple ecosystem, and she's strictly interested in Linux. She just she wants the lighter hardware. Well, now, I could I have have debated a... with her all the light computers that are not Macs that would run Linux just fine. I have a I have a project for us if you're interested. Uh, yeah. I, uh, so I had, I used to have, I still have it, a 2011 MacBook Pro that used to do some of our editing for our shows. And, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> turns out a lot of the times Apple doesn't build very good computers. And, uh, the whole line had video card problems, just lots of video uh -huh. card issues. Mine was one of them. The video card died. And of course it died early because I did a lot of GPU based tasks, uh, well, uh, kind of good guy Apple in a sense, they, they just made good. And they're fixing the laptops even like from 2011 that are out of warranty. So I just – they just fixed the laptop. I now have a fully functional 2011 pretty well-equipped 
MacBook Pro. It's probably got like 16 gigs of RAM and maybe an early core series processor. Uh, uh-huh. I, th- I think we should put. I think we should get Arch working on that thing. I think we should. Um, and uh, and then we can then we could try it out. Are we, we going to for, we going to format and install Arch? Well, yeah, yeah, no, no, no Mac OS at all. Yeah, totally. All right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because right. I'm always talking about uh, at my ass about how horrible Linux is on the MacBooks. But I think the uh-huh. sweet spot is probably a little bit older of a MacBook, and we can try it out. And I'll give you my take on the show. Uh, all right, so uh, this one I've really been looking forward to. I haven't seen. Oh, did you Bef- have one more? Yeah. Before you move on, can I add one more thing? Yeah, totally. Did you notice if you compare? And the um, I think the Ubuntu interviews are going to come out in Linux Unplugged. But when when they come out and you compare and contrast um, the Ubuntu phone to the Mozilla phone, notice how she says we have a couple thousand apps available in Mozilla uh, on the Mozilla uh, store, mm-hmm. and Ubuntu phone has I think they said seven hundred ninety eight or eight hundred apps. Mm-hmm. So I mean. That's amazing because the pro- the Mozilla pro- phone project got started. Firefox OS got started after Ubuntu phone, right? B- Ubuntu Touch. And yet, but it's been out a little longer, and they've had some of the tools out, and the technologies right. are a little more standardized. They're each, more HTML. But it just of, shows which like direction people are. Uh, that community is kind of shifting towards. Yeah, right? yeah. I say the so. game is early in that. I say because mm-hmm. you know the reason why I say that is, mm-hmm. and this is just my sort of my frank opinion is. Uh, I feel like the apps that I really like on Ubuntu Touch are better than the apps I like on Firefox OS. Like, so the early mm-hmm. apps are really good. Like, there's some really good stuff. There, I feel like there are more full-fledged applications on Ubuntu Touch, and I think that might edge out long. We'll see. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right. So um, <clears throat> this interview I've been looking forward to. I haven't. I, I actually di- didn't watch the whole thing. I just kind of watched the bits of it to, to edit it. I saved it for the show. So we recently had uh, the Elementary OS project on the show, and we asked them some hard questions about some recent kind of controversial stuff. And unfortunately, that really dominated the discussion. And so now Noah got a chance to talk about some other stuff. So here's that interview from Scale. On the main floor again at Scale 2015, and I guess who I ran into? Cassidy. Everyone remembers Cassidy. He was on the Linux Action Show just a couple of weeks ago, and we asked him some tough questions about elementary OS, which he answered. Today, we wanted to dig in a little bit more to what his project is actually all about. Now, I was chatting with Cassidy off camera, and he has gone through to explain some of the very tiny little details (laughs) that a lot of Linux distributions are overlooking, but elementary, they're catching on, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah, I was showing him that um, in our newest beta version of Elementary OS Freya, we, we round the corners of the screen just ever so slightly. It's something you wouldn't notice if you uh, weren't looking for it, but it, it just gives it that that uh, cleaner feel. And it's, it's one of those things where I think that people in the Linux community are so focused on trying to get usable, workable software that they just don't pay attention to the little details. So that's what we need people like you that are willing to dig in and say, listen, that rounded corner, that's not important to anyone else. It's important to me. I'm going to fix that rounded corner, right? Yeah. And you know, and I think that's what gives uh, Elementary OS that really polished feel. Now, you were also telling me that your wife, you are a user of Elementary OS. Is that right? Yes, I am. And you, you started originally on Windows, but you decided to make a change. What prompted that? Windows was very frustrating. Um, and I saw Cass using elementary on his computer, and I thought, like, I want that. Like, like I, I want the speed and the beauty, because I'm a graphic designer, and so, like, elementary was aesthetically pleasing, and Windows was just, like, getting on my nerves, and so I'm like, I, I want elementary. So I think, I think a lot of people, when, they, when Windows starts to get frustrating, they go over to the Mac. Why, why did you jump to, to Linux rather than the Mac? Um, well, Cass is my husband. <laughs> no Linux in my house, or no Mac in my house. <laughs> and um, Mac is cost prohibitive. Yes. Um, and I don't, I don't need to have the Apple on my computer. Mm-hmm. Like, and Mac, Mac doesn't have a monopoly on design. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's something that's important to me. And Elementary has that. And at the same time, um, you know, she had a, re- she has a really high end, nice laptop. Uh-huh. Um, she didn't need to buy a new MacBook. You know, she had a nice high end. Core i7 Samsung laptop or whatever, and she could, she had Windows on that, and she could install Elementary on that, and uh, get a lot more speed out of it, out of the same hardware. Do you feel like you're missing, or that that anything is compromised when you're using Elementary OS back, f- compared to back when you use Windows, or or compared to some of the people that you may know that use Mac? Um, yes, um, there are certain programs like the Adobe Suite. There, there are some programs for Linux that mm-hmm. are comparable, like GIMP and Inkscape, yeah. but um, there's nothing really for InDesign, uh-huh. and so sometimes, like, out of necessity, like, I do need to use proprietary operating systems sure. um, to get that work done, but overall, like, 
it's only out of necessity. Yep. I'm like, well, I have to boot into Windows today, or yep. I, I almost always use elementary otherwise. That's outstanding. And Cassidy, as a, as, as, a, as a coder, as a developer, is that something that you might be looking into, is, is looking to start getting into design software? It's hard because, you know, we have a limited amount of resources, right? So building an operating system is a huge undertaking. Um, people don't realize, you know, the entire, everything the user sees, elementary has built for the most part, including mm -hmm. the, the desktop environment and the applications, and we've designed and developed all these things. Um, if we had more developer manpower, we might get into something like that, but uh -huh. as of now, we, we'd rather see projects like uh, GIMP and Inkscape, you know, really flourish, and uh, yeah. we've actually, you know, contributed some money to Inkscape so they can get together and, and they can... Um, you know, have a meetup and, and really improve their software as well. And when you design the UI elements for Elementary OS, is that being done in Linux? Yeah, um, Daniel Ferre, our main designer, does everything in Inkscape. Um, a lot of designers use Inkscape in both that and GIMP. So yeah, it's all done in Linux. Um, we really, when people come over and you know they're a designer who has typically used Adobe Illustrator, uh, and they want to help design for elementary, we say, hey, here's the first thing you need to do is, is open up Inkscape and get used to it, because that's all of our files are shared through Inkscape, and, and uh, we really prefer working with that workflow. Yeah, that's outstanding. And, and the nice thing is, when you, if, you, if, there is a, if there is somebody that wanted to contribute or wanted to learn, mm -hmm. um, what is the cost that they're going to have to put forward to get an operating system and all the tools that they need? Um, it's available for pay what you want for elementary OS, so including zero dollars. So if, if you can't afford it, if you're like a student that's in college and you have all these costs for, for schooling and books and stuff, and you need something for free, you can get it for free. Um, Inkscape is available for free. On the other hand, if you get value out of that and um, you, know, you can't afford it, uh, it's great to be able to put money back into it to help the products improve. That's outstanding. Anything that either of you would like to add? Otherwise, where can somebody go to contribute to elementary OS or uh, download it if they were interested? If you go to elementary.io, we have information there about um, the product, and there's a Get Involved link that you can click. It tells you about um, if you want to get involved with design or translating or web development, uh, where you can go to get involved with all those projects. Outstanding. Thank you so much for both of your time. I really appreciate it. Thank okay. you. That was really interesting. I'm glad you got to cover some of those extra basics uh, with them. And uh, I also was wondering, I had a good... I had a good impression that they designed their desktop under Linux, but it was good to get like the official answer there. So that was a good question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he uses they use, and I asked this the week before when we had him on the program as well. I asked, I said, "What are you guys using um, to connect?" And even the MacBook that they have, um, they just use it to test. It's primarily the 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 time is spent in Elementary That's OS, great. but they want to make sure that Elementary OS works really well on the Mac, which, as you've pointed out numerous times, is incredibly important if we are to be a good receiving group for the people that are flocking to us from Apple, yeah, assuming people that People that burn out and stuff like that. Right. Uh, all right. But, um, but th those people, again, Cassidy is just another example. Um, you know, him and I may disagree on the finer yeah. points of, of funding elementary OS, but we agree at, at a very basic level, him and I can both get behind the idea, uh, as, you, as you do as well, the, uh, this idea that, that Linux belongs on the desktop, Linux can make a good competitor on the desktop, and it can compete very well with either Mac or Windows. Mm -hmm. And he believes that, and he's putting his money where his mouth yeah. is, he's eating his own dog food, I, and he's making his wife do the, the same. The other thing, yeah, the other thing I like about elementary OS is, uh, well, she's volunteering to do it at least, um, that mm -hmm. uh, it, it sort of is testing the other end of the spectrum. So I sort of sit on the arch, rolling release, super fast updates, mm -hmm. crazy, get it all mm -hmm. in as fast as possible. They're sitting on the refine it, tweak it, you know, long tail. Mm -hmm. And that's also a really interesting spectrum of the Linux desktop to explore. And I'm glad they're mm -hmm. sort of doing it to a, to an arch. Uh, now, do you think that they're doing anything that that offers a significant competitive advantage over what stock Ubuntu has? Uh, I think if you are somebody who values craftsmanship, yes. So, okay. uh, you know, and I, I like, um, you know, some people are really picky about the furniture they get. They want furniture that's really well crafted or the phone mm -hmm. that they buy or the laptop, mm -hmm. right, or whatever it is. Or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for me, like, I really like really well crafted, funny enough, kitchen appliances. I think those are really nice. Mm -hmm. I like stuff that I can use for, like, you know, 30 years or whatever, like, ideally. Like, uh, mm -hmm. whereas I think Elementary OS is it's a handcrafted artisan distro. Um, and I think that it's in itself could be enough to be compelling to a group of people. Uh, and then uh, at a certain point, when you look at how the desktop gets good enough, uh, I, I think they are going to make something pretty compelling that I would draw a lot of Mac users one day. The only thing so I can see is... Would, go ahead. Uh, my, my understanding from what you're telling me is then is that you think that it's more polished than, than, than the other alternatives like Ubuntu. And my question then becomes, is it 
so much more polished that it's worth giving up the backing of a large organization like Canonical, you know, that, that, can, that can make sweeping changes uh, with relative ease because of their size and their influence on the rest of the community. I just don't think it's possible. So it's not really like, is it worth mm-hmm. it? Because you couldn't, you mm-hmm. couldn't have a designer-led vision th- in a company mm-hmm. like that. Uh, uh, sure. You know, like uh, the, the, the unique thing they have by being off on their own thing is if they decide it's worth spending five days of developer time to round the corners, no one's mm-hmm. going to tell them no. And right. as an end user who wants that artisan product, I want yep. the person who's maybe walking the line of artist designing that and putting, if that's what he or she wants to spend their time working on, that's the product I mm-hmm. want. I don't think if they worked for Canonical or whoever, they could do something like that. Who would ever allow somebody to spend their time doing something like that unless they were, you know, mm-hmm. a designer themselves? So, uh, you know, one of our favorite apps on the Linux desktop, and we've never had them on the show. So uh, mm-hmm. Noah finally righted that wrong at scale. He got a chance to talk to the VLC project. They have some really cool stuff in the works. So uh, here was that interview from the floor of scale. On the floor at scale 2015, or as they call it, scale 13X, I keep being reminded, we are, on the he- we are here from one of my absolute all-time favorite projects, VLC. And the cool thing about VideoLand over... Um, some of the other players is it does a lot more than just play videos. Yes, I use it on every airplane ride I've ever been on to watch all of my DVDs, which are ripped in an ISO, and I can just open them with VLC, and as well as every other format on the face of the planet. But it's also capable of doing live streaming, receiving streams, uh, recording uncompressed video, all those things, and I use every last bit of it. I'm here with Ludovic from the project. How are you doing today? I'm um, good. Really good. Happy uh, to be here. Yeah, yeah, and you know, and it's it's cool because I've been to a lot of conferences, but Scale clearly has some of the really some of the really big hitters, right? Like I would have not expected to see anyone from VLC. So the the, the opportunity to meet you guys and speak with you is absolutely outstanding. So for somebody that has that has been previously living under a rock, tell me exactly what VLC is. Uh, so VLC, uh, there are two parts in VLC. There is uh, the player that not everyone knows basically uh, because. Old people use VLC for opening all kind of weird formats and play videos. Uh, but it's also a complete framework because you can use uh, VLC um, to code new applications and to decode videos and to stream them and so on. So it's a complete framework to do all kind of stuff from business to uh, streaming to uh, TV station. They all use VLC basically. Yeah, that, and that, that is outstanding to hear. You said TV station, so it, it's interesting that you guys are aware of the, the, the truly professional uh, a- application that, that, or the truly professional implementations of, the, of, of your application. So, um, you know, at, at Jupiter Broadcasting, we use VLC to send a lot of the remote feeds back to the studio before they go out on the air. In fact, the stream that plays uh, constantly, uh, that, that airs anytime we're not actually on the air, is actually being powered by VLC. The other thing I've noticed is you guys have uh, it, the ability to, to truly be multi-platform. I, is there a platform you're not on? Uh, currently, all the recent platform we are on them, even the WinRC ones, uh, mm-hmm. which is quite new and it's going to be launched in, on the store uh, in a few days here. Uh, but basically, we don't work on uh, some embedded device, but that's pretty rare anyway. So yeah, yeah. And I, I, I installed the day the day I heard that VLC came out for Android. I I got out of bed and I literally ran to my phone to install it, and I was so pleased to see I can actually open ISOs on my phone. Yeah, yeah. That's that's what we wanted to do basically. And uh, the, on Android, there was uh, quite a few players already, uh, but. The people were really waiting and they were really expecting VLC uh, like you and many others uh, to have VLC on their phone too, so we're pretty happy with that. Now, tell me a little bit about some of the more advanced features. VLC, every time, I feel like every time I open VLC and I open one of the menus, I discover something new that VLC is capable of that I was previously using another application for that I really didn't need to use another application for. Yeah, as I told you, it's a framework. So uh, there are even functionalities that are not available in the, in the UI in the interface uh, because most of the features are uh, command line based uh, mm-hmm. so there is plenty of features and VLC can do basically everything professionals need mm-hmm. so 
So I could actually run VLC, because I think this might not be so well known. You can actually run VLC without even having a desktop environment and uh, and, and allow for maybe receiving um, things like an IceCast stream might be able to be done right within VLC, right from the command line without ever even having a head. Yeah, you, as a client or even as a server, you can stream stuff uh, from your server. And uh, yeah, basically VLC runs uh, on a lot of servers worldwide to do the encoding and transcoding of videos. Uh, so the interface is clearly not uh, needed for some stuff. Outstanding. Um, now, I know that you guys are coming up on, on a very big release, and I am daily waiting for that to happen. Do you have any information about when we might see that coming? Uh, probably in the next few days. Uh, really? the, the new release is going out uh, maybe tomorrow or the day after. Really? Yeah. Oh, outstanding. So um, I'm, I'm going to have to check even with more anticipation tomorrow. Yeah. If it's not there tomorrow, can I come back and harass you? Yeah, sure. Come back tomorrow <laughs> then. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. We really appreciate it. Oh, VL. Oops, I hit the wrong button. VLC just released uh, version 2.2.0 or something like that. Not quite the update we were hoping. Not the 3.0 update. Yeah, 2.2.0. Right. Yeah. yeah, and here's the thing. I was, uh, I was so excited to look uh, the next day when I woke up, and then uh, I, I don't know if it came out in the stream or not, to, but uh, I was remarkably sick that day. And yes. so the last thing I really cared about was VLC. Yeah. Um, but I just look now, and it, it's still not out. Well, so I feel like... The 2.2.0 came out instead, yeah. All right, yeah. one last clip from Scale, because I thought we're going to wrap and just talk a little about Scale itself. And so before we do that, I want to play this interview, uh, because uh, it, it shows uh, kind of a couple of really outstanding things about Scale. One... The, the really, truly legitimate community effort behind it, too. Uh, the innovative mm -hmm. approach they have to managing uh, wireless infrastructure at a conference. And three, uh, the fact that uh, this is a template that I think a lot of other conferences could follow. We'll talk about that right after uh, we play uh, this interview from the floor. We're on the floor, day two of Scale 2015, and as I'm walking around the floor, everyone that's ever been to a conference knows what a pain it is to connect to Wi-Fi, because there's always a password, and it's on some little brochure that's stuck in some bag that you probably lost five minutes after you got here. Um, I see these three ladies that are walking around, and they have the password on their shirt. So I asked, uh, I asked a little bit about it. It turns out Stu is the visionary genius that decided to come up with putting the tech team, so the people that run the scale show, uh, they put the Wi-Fi password on their shirt, and Stu agreed to sit down and tell us a little bit about uh, what it takes to run, uh, you know, to run the technology of a show this size. How are you today, Stu? I'm doing good, thank you. Well, thanks for taking the time to talk to us. And I guess my first question is, how is it? Uh, what? How many access points do you have in this building to get uh, to get the, the the internet's so solid here. Well, currently we deliver a little under 60 access points uh, throughout the entire show, uh, as well as over 160 VLANs to separate the network out for all of the different booths and all of the different functions that we use, along with dedicated uh, VLANs that are operated strictly for the video feeds, as well as for uh, management systems. Okay, now do you, is this, are you employed, um, uh, are, are you, you work for a company that, that has been contracted to do this, or? Oh, no, 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 no. Everyone that works at scale uh -huh. is a volunteer. Wow. No one that you see on the floor working at scale is a paid employee. We all dedicate our time just to make this conference happen. Unbelievable. And the fact is, the internet here works far better at some conferences that I've been to that I know for a fact they paid a lot of money to have. And that, that is made possible by you and your team then, is that correct? Well, we do put it all together. We have lots of help. Uh, the hotel has been extremely friendly to us, allowing us access to their entire infrastructure so we're able to do this. Uh, and they have really aggressively marketed to us in a price range that makes it very affordable for us to do it. I'd just like to send a shout out to the Hilton IT staff for all the help that they put forward to us, uh, as well as everybody on the tech team and the AV team for what goes into this. You know, we start this thing on Tuesday. Yeah. Uh -huh. We come in Tuesday night and take this place over like locusts. <laughs> 
can you uh, can you tell me a little bit about the specific access points? Or, uh, what brand they are, and and uh, and what speed they're they're rated for? Are they NG. You know, all of them are consumer grade um, wireless routers. Uh, we're running OpenWRT in order to configure them remotely. Uh, both are dual, all of them are dual band. Uh, we have two different models of access points. Uh, this year we're using a lot of net gears, but we've used others in the past. That's unbelievable. And I, 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 I am not just, uh, I'm not just blowing smoke at you when I tell you that I have been to conferences where they have, and I'm talking eight, nine hundred, uh, sometimes fourteen hundred dollars in access point, and the network here is far more reliable. I haven't lost Wi-Fi once on my phone. That's really important for us to keep in contact back at the studio and being able to send messages, and I, it has one drop. So you're doing an outstanding job. And to do that on DDWRT means that essentially you're powering the Linux convention with Linux. Oh, absolutely. And the firewall basically is Linux. All of our routing equipment is Linux. Uh -huh. The only thing that's actually running commercial firmware are our switches. That's, that's truly incredible. Well, um, Oh, last thing I wanted to mention was, could you tell me a little bit about the displays that I see around that are showing the, the network traffic? Those are really cool. Well, those were actually uh, done by uh, uh, two people, David Newman and uh, David Lang, mm -hmm. and they worked together to do these signs. Basically what we're doing is we're taking combinations of SNMP data mm -hmm. as well as uh, doing um, oh, uh, searches on logs to assemble all the data. Um, and we've done some interesting things with the signs these uh, this year. Uh, the signs, by the way, are all uh, powered by Raspberry Pis. So, that's so cool. <laughs> that's so cool. Anyway, so the, what happens is the Raspberry Pis actually pull a server in order to get the sign information. Uh -huh. And uh, the sign software, I don't know if you are familiar with Gareth Greenaway, one of the other organizers of the conference, uh -huh. the sign software was actually written by him uh, for the server side. Okay. So. Uh, it's great because we can make any device on our system act as any kind of sign that we want, whether it's a schedule display or the network data, you know, uh, makes it very flexible because you know how these things change. I mean, one minute to the next, we may have a different need for uh, moving people around. Absolutely. It's absolutely fantastic. It, it, you know, the more I talk to you, the more excited I am. Because it, well, the reality is, like, even something as simple as using the pies, right? I, I have experience in digital signage, but we've always used commercial proprietary stuff. So the fact that Linux, that's a true vote of confidence for Linux, that you guys are doing all this with Linux. And the amount of times I've seen a conference that are truly powered by Macs, when you pull back the curtain, it is awesome to see that when I, that when you when you go poking around scale, there's actually a lot of Linux here. That That's really encouraging. If anyone wanted to find out more information? Did you, is there a plug that you wanted to give of where people can get into contact or find more information? You know, I have to tell you, a great source of information about the conference is our website. That would be www.socallinuxexpo.org. If you'd like to know any more about me, you can see my blog at www.stuartsheldon.org. Uh, and uh, if you want to participate, if you want to be part of the show, just send an email to Stu at SoCalLinuxExpo.org and we'll get you on the team that you can be the most help to because we love new volunteers. Well, we really appreciate it. Thanks for giving that vote of confidence to Linux. We sure appreciate it. I, I think that really a couple of things jumped out of me. Uh, first of all, I love how they're using Linux everywhere. In fact, uh, Noah, you mm -hmm. found the... Uh, the link to the GitHub repo for their signs. So we'll put the code right. for their signs in the show notes if if you want to check that out. Uh, and you yep. know, also, which we didn't we didn't actually capture in, in a recording, but to give you mm -hmm. an idea of how good the Wi-Fi worked at that conference, Noah actually took his laptop and live streamed. He walked around the floor right. and live streamed it, and the Wi-Fi stayed right. connected the whole time. So let's compare uh, and contrast a little bit. The, up until I went to scale, the best Wi-Fi I'd ever had at a conference was actually uh, done by a company called Global Vision down at Self. And they did an excellent job, but it was all done with proprietary hardware. And even there, we had some issues. It certainly wasn't good enough for streaming, um, It was, but it was more than enough that I could at least get the schedule and stuff on my phone. Um, the worst, sadly, admittedly, is it was at Linux Fest Northwest. I mean, the Wi-Fi there, I don't even know why they bother putting Wi-Fi up because it 
Uh, did it ever work, Chris, for you? It didn't work for me. Uh, no, uh, no. It's, I mean, maybe once every five seconds, or once uh, for like five seconds, every couple of hours, I would get a Wi-Fi signal and get a couple messages. I wonder but if that's that, due to the way that to, to the density of that one room. And also remember, their Wi-Fi network is a student-managed yeah. project as part of their credit. That is what I would say is the biggest difference is that you have uh, you have a lot of people that are are learning to do this and 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 so the the configuration is probably the the limiting factor. But what what stands out to me is uh, at at uh, at even at uh, self, even though the Wi-Fi was very good, you're still talking. I mean, and he was using he wasn't they weren't using uh, Cisco stuff, and it was still very very expensive. And at Linux Fest Northwest, they're using a lot of Cisco and Juniper stuff. And I mean, Cisco stuff. If you know anything about it, you're looking at like fifteen hundred dollars an access. Mm -hmm. That's not uncommon, and and so the end of this week actually, I spent I spent almost all of Thursday and Friday troubleshooting wireless network issues, and we actually ripped out all of the access points of a building and put in a new managed system. And the entire time, all I could think about as I'm watching users climb and, and the the access points, uh, you know, they have they have limits, uh, publish limits, and all I could think about was, man. They're using $35 Netgear right. routers, yeah. and they had 3,000 people connected over these 60 access points. And you, you know, you know that no matter how well they planned, yeah. uh, three, 2,500 of those all wound up on like six of them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they, yes. all can, they all came to one place because that's what would happen. Mm -hmm. um, and and so to and I never, never lost internet on my phone. And it, like you said, the, the 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 quality was so good, the bandwidth was so good that I was actually able to do streaming. And that's all possible because of Linux on inexpensive hardware and better than enterprise level service. I mean, it was truly unbelievable. It's pretty awesome. And that's not even talking about the way they use the pies and stuff. So uh, scale is officially added to your must go to list of uh, Linux conventions. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah all right. it, it was. It was the the fact that the fact that there, there are three things that that made it for me. One is I saw very little to no people using Apple products right, or right. Windows. Uh, add to that, I saw a lot of people that were really concerned about Linux and specifically Linux on the desktop. Um, when I was I was at another conference, uh, you know, a couple months ago, and I had to borrow a cable. And I went back, and they had the, they had this curtain where all the production stuff was, and they pulled the curtain back, and there were two eight-foot tables. And from left to right, uh, it was just iMac, 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 iMac. There was probably 16 of them that were running the, the conference. And then on the other side, there was another eight-foot table, and they had like nine MacBook Pros. And that's how they were powering that Linux convention. Yeah. And so to see, to, when you pull back the curtain at scale, and you're seeing Raspberry Pis plugged into televisions, and, and it looks just as good. It lo in fact, sure, in some cases, it looked better. Yeah. Um, and that's all being done with Linux. To me, that is, that's, that's the, those are the kind of people I want to talk to. Because, he, and here's what I found. I found that everyone that is telling me things can't be done on Linux, oh, that's not possible. You can't do that in Linux. Linux doesn't have the tools for that. Those people are just getting in the way of those people that are actually doing it. And that, that was truly exemplified at scale. Boom. And uh, you know mm -hmm. what? It makes me look forward to Linux Fest Northwest, not, not only because we're going to get to meet a whole bunch of people, but about a whole new set of interviews, mm -hmm. whole net, a whole new set of production challenges for us. And it's just around the corner. It's going to be at the end of April. Uh, and uh -huh. I, 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 I was really impressed from afar. It looked like a lot, a lot of good attendees, a lot of good exhibitors, uh, some good mm -hmm. talks. So, uh, and last but not least, don't forget, we also have a four and a half hour live stream capture linked in the show notes. You can watch that if you want even more scale stuff, and we'll have a little bit more scale stuff in Linux Unplugged on Tuesday, like the uh, Ubuntu booth interview and stuff like that. Noah, great work at scale, man. That was really top-notch stuff. Maybe I'll make it out there with you next time. Thanks really a lot cool. for uh, thanks a lot for providing all the support to make it possible. It yeah. was a lot of fun. And the and I was really glad the live stream works. And we'll tell people probably next week. I think it'll be the episode where we tell people how we did the live stream from scale using all mm -hmm. Linux stuff, high definition, thirty frames per second video. We'll pro I think next week if the schedule works out, we'll have we'll go in depth on how we made that work uh, behind the scenes. But uh, no, that's all our coverage for scale thirteen x. <laughs> And that brings us to the end of this week's broadcast. But Noah, before we get out of here, you've collected us some great feedback this week. And our first one comes from Insomniac Lemon. I think it's addressed to you. So do you want to take it away, sir? Sure. Uh, Insomniac Lemon writes in and says, Noah, Noah mentioned in... Uh, Noah mentioned that big issues with software on Linux, in-house modified, and... Not in, re not not in, in the, the repos. repos. Yeah. But I'd like to take that further and say that the software that supports Linux may not be created for non-movie game studio enterprise users. Take Autodesk, for example. 
they have a, they actually have quite a few of their programs that support Linux, but you wouldn't know it based on their site. Linux is not in a is not an option on the download dialog, but if you dig around for help in the old files and change them, you can find newer versions. Not only that, but their software is bulky and has to be registered before the install. If your install doesn't go right, you've wasted your use of a serial number. They also don't offer trial versions in Linux. I really wish Autodesk would lighten their software and release it through Steam mm. as a cheaper non-commercial version. Yeah, that'd be nice. Uh, uh, not only would it solve cross-distro compatibility, it would cover the DRM aspect and allow them to tap into a platform they technically support, but not really unless you're a big studio running Red Hat systems. Now, the, you know, this was a, there was a couple pieces of feedback that touched along uh, similar lines. And one of them was um, people pointed me to things like Blender and said, well, a lot, a lot of that movie studio stuff, it, it is available for Linux. And that wasn't quite what I was getting at. I wasn't necessarily saying that there weren't tools available in Linux to do some of that movie-like stuff. What I was saying was there are very, very robust, very, very refined tools that Hollywood is using. And those exact specific tools, the exact binaries that they are using are not available to normal users. And how cool would it be if at some point that changed? Yeah. That's kind of what I was getting at. And I like the idea of using the Steam store for distributing big apps like that on Linux because they, mm -hmm. Autodesk has software in the day. They just don't make it available for Linux. Uh, Jason mm -hmm. writes in with contributing to elementary OS. He says, hello, Noah and Chris. I've been reading and reading last. Huh, wow. And probably listening to last for a year. And I love the show. I recently watched episode 352 where you talk to the developers behind elementary OS. You ask the guys about funding EOS and how an open source operating system has to grow in some way. While I haven't helped EOS financially, actually it's just elementary OS, uh, I have been using the beta version for two months. Also, I've been helping by implementing a small feature on elementary OS. While not everyone can help a project with money, you have told people before that they can help OS in many ways. And his point is, you can also help contribute in code and bugs. Thanks, you guys. Keep bringing the Linux goodness. All right, Mr. No, you want to take our last email of the day uh, from uh, Jesse? Yeah, last feedback comes in from Jesse, uh, and the subject is, uh, Matt's predictions were correct. Elementary has been forked. I was just looking at DistroWatch after having issues with Cody on Zorin. Uh, when I saw that they had added a new distro, EOS Free, it's basically a ripoff of Elementary. So no. far, it's just... Yeah. So far, it is just a crude site on Google Blogger, but this might turn into a new competitor or a new leech to elementary. You can find more here, and he gives the website. P.S. Zorin OS Ultimate is an unstable expletive. Um, huh. So, uh, you know, I mean, here's the, I mean, that is the nature of open source, right? If you're going to make a project, then I don't think Cassidy in any way is going to be uh, surprised about this. If you, if you make an open source piece of software, chances are it's going to get forked. Uh, or chances are somebody is, if they like it, they're going to use it or they're going to try and improve on it. And that's just the nature of the beast. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I don't think that's bad. In fact, uh, isn't it uh, the, the biggest form of flattery is uh, impersonation? Intimidate. Uh, yeah, yeah. Something like that. Not intimidation, saying, but, uh, but the biggest form of yeah. flattery is uh, uh, when you... Impersonation? Impersonation or something Copy. like that. I think yeah. it's also just that's why, I mean, open source is sort of about getting inspired by somebody's ideas and, and growing from there. It will get attraction. That's mm -hmm. a whole other story. Uh, Noah, what if I wanted to, like, uh, you know, know more about what you do during the day? Is there, like, maybe a website out there I could check out? Like you a, could you could head over to altaspeed.com oh. and uh, if you're some if you're within driving or flying area apparently we do internships now so <laughs> uh, we had a viewer that came out last week and decided he wanted to spend some time uh, uh, job shadowing and so I gave him the option I said you can either follow a couple one of our technicians around and, and see what we do on a daily basis or I will just set aside a day and we can go find Linux in the wild it, you know I put it there so <laughs> I don't you know, know where to really find in the it. wild but, but yeah right but I'll, I'll go around and I'll show you where we use Linux. And so we uh, we 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 went around and looked at uh, how we implement corporate networks and 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 big name stuff and and how how Linux plays a, a vital role and stuff like that. That's really and cool. And that's available at altaspeed.com as well as I'm on Twitter at Kernel Linux and of course facebookcom slash Kernel Linux, which everyone likes. And I'm after I finish uh, after I finish uh, flush flushing out everything on Twitter, I will move over to Google Plus, Google.com slash plus Noah Chalaya. Yeah, and we have those linked in the show notes as well. 
well. I am twitter.com slash Chris LAS. I want to also remind you, you can help make this show even better and engage at a level that uh, is like on any other resource. And that's our subreddit. We check it multiple times a day, linuxactionshow.reddit.com. Your app picks, your runs Linuxes are always appreciated. Stories, comments, and votes. Um, and I, if you've maybe pulled back a little bit recently, I would ask you to come back and sort of re-engage because your Linux Action Show needs you. So go over to linuxactionshow.reddit.com and make this show even better. And last but not least, don't forget, you can join us live. We start Sundays, 10 a.m. Pacific. Go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar and get it converted to your local time zone. I really recommend if you've never checked out a live show, it's way, way, way more show. We've been going for hours and hours now. We took breaks in between. Noah gave out digital ocean credits. It really, truly is a great experience, and it's just way more show. And you can catch it every single Sunday over at jblive.tv. And we have the calendar page. Don't forget about the contact link, though, at jupiterbroadcasting.com. That is being monitored now more than ever. Yeah. Every response, that everything that comes in, it gets it gets a solid read. And except if you start in this, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a pro tip. Okay. Pro tip is <laughs> if you start the subject line with something like, I have ditched Linux for Mac OS or I've ditched <gasps> Linux for Windows, that's a great way for me just to avoid that altogether. But if you've done something exciting with Linux or you want to support Linux and you write that in, um, you'll either get a, a, a reply or at least it will get fully read and vetted and put into the appropriate folder for the appropriate episode that comes up. And that's, of course, jupiterbroadcasting.com. Click on the contact link from the drop-down menu, right? Beautiful, sir. Beautiful. And also, uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for uh, uh, your emails. Thank you very much for the subreddit. But really, thank you also for everybody, all your title suggestions during the live show. We also appreciate that. It's a great way to get the title. So it's a really, it's, the community really is involved at all different levels of the show. And Noah, thanks for the great work at scale. Thanks to everybody who came down and said hi to Noah and stopped by the live stream. Uh, and I hope to see a lot of you guys at Linux Fest Northwest. And hopefully next week you'll find out how we did all of that stuff on the big show. So, so that should be really good. And don't forget to check out Linux Unplugged for a little bit more scale coverage on Tuesday this week. All right, everybody. Well, thanks so much for tuning this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. See you right back here next week. So have you, have you noticed that a couple of vendors have bailed from Android to uh, Tizen, or in LG's case, WebOS. Uh, yep, Samsung. Samsung actually, went to Tizen. There was a lot of couple a couple couple days ago that their Tizen phone was like one of the most successful launches ever, and they are doubling down on Tizen. Well, and so uh, the Verge has a write up at the new uh, on LG's new WebOS uh, one, which we talked about a little bit. I a love little me some WebOS. Yeah, exactly. So I, I was gonna I was gonna play a little bit of this because. I'm thinking. Uh, I'm thinking when you have more of a pure Linux stack, you're gonna have you're gonna eke out just that little itsy bits of more performance than you do out of the uh, more uh, complicated Android stack. So I'm wondering if Tizen and uh, WebOS might have a little edge up over Android. And the Android Wear watches have only sold about 760,000 in 2014. That's not they had didn't even break the million. And in fact, like uh, over 100,000 of those were in the last 30 days because of a uh, fire sale that one of the watchmakers. Went through, so uh, it, the jury is still ma majorly out on this. So WebOS could have a shot. It, it makes use of the uh, circular display in a way that Android Wear doesn't really. You kind of it, look it's how still smooth that is. to scroll through these things. Uh, there's three buttons yeah, the on, on the responses. edge. This one is a quick settings. You can push it and uh, you know adjust the brightness and so on. And right here, you have a back button to take you back out of the app that you've entered. Um, so what does this thing have? Well, there's uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff. There's this is a Korean video platform. There's a kind of a voice assistant that can check your contacts, the health tracking app, a gut cycle. You know, I don't know. I, all this talk about uh, watches has actually started to make me kind of want one eventually. But I'm actually, after everything, I'm starting to just trend towards the pebble. No, man, I have looked. Everywhere has plastic terracotta now. Everywhere. Oh, really? Lowe's, dude. Lowe's has plastic. terracotta pots. No. That's where I got mine. I watched really? that. I, I watched that episode of Alton Brown, and uh -huh. I went out that weekend to try to buy clay. I went to, like, all, right. all of them. I could, they were all plastic. Okay, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna come. I'm gonna come to Washington, and I'm gonna find terracotta. And if I if I call ahead of time and they don't have it, then I'm gonna ship the terracotta to no, you. No, I, I, I'm it. sure somewhere around here, like some stonery or something, probably has it. But like, <laughs> you live in one of the biggest metropolitan areas in the in the country, and you don't think you can find a terracotta pot? I think you can find a dude. Terracotta I pot. even went to. We have. We they just closed down, but we have. We used to have this ginormous plant farm. It was huge. I even went there. All plastic. It's either plastic mm -hmm. or they're like wicker. Okay. I'm telling you. Uh, okay. L l let me back up. Let me ask you this because I f still feel I don't have a straight answer from you. Have you ever had like 
actual barbecue to compare to what you think is barbecue. That hurts, Noah. That hurts. I know. But I, I just don't think it's fair. I don't think it's fair to be like, oh, look, wow. what we can make in the Weber Grill or the smoker in a couple hours. It's just not the same. No, no, no. I, I will reserve judgment. Well, that's not. Well, that's why if we go out to barbecue, we'll go to a place that does yeah. it right. But okay, yeah. Well, they'll have a pit. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, if but, they have a pit, then then the. But what I'm telling you is, you can still do mm -hmm. good barbecue. You just do different kind of barbecue in like a Weber. It still can be delicious. It's still good food. How I can don't you think not qualifies as barbecue? I think it qualifies as grilled food. Don't or put barbecue food. in a box. You're putting barbecue right. in a box. How can you All put right, barbecue in a I'll box? Try. Like if you make a deli so, uh, uh, here's what I made last night. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I marinated two ginormous chicken breasts. Mm -hmm. uh, from our local, uh, you know, uh, butcher, and I, I marinated them in a mango vinaigrette sauce. Okay, so get them kind of oh. sweet a little bit, and then I, I kind of flattened them a little bit so they were a little thinner. And then mm -hmm. I barbecued mm -hmm. them on a super hot charcoal grill, which you just have to be real careful because chicken can get dry. And then what and I did it. is I roasted three cloves of three full bl uh, bulbs of garlic, uh, mm -hmm. and then I took some butter, some nice uh, uh, grass-fed beef, uh, uh, sweet cream butter. And I got that going in a pan real hot, like a stir-fry style pan, and I threw in the mm -hmm. garlic that was roasted, and I fried that in the butter for a little bit. And then I put in like, uh, mm -hmm. what else did I put in? Oh, oh, and then, of course, I put in salt. Uh, and then I put mm -hmm. in a ton of uh, local honey, and I got that mm -hmm. sauce all real nice and hot, and I got it all put together. And then I went and brushed mm -hmm. the chicken with all of that, and it, and it sort of caramelized on the outside of the Hold chicken. On a second. <laughs> okay, continue. And Carl, Sorry. the the edges of the oh, you know why am I? Hold on a second. I could probably just show you. I have pictures of this. I might. I don't know. Let Depen me guess. Let me guess. You Instagrammed. No, I you didn't did this, actually. Right? I uh -huh. I resisted the temptation to Instagram, but my maybe my uh -huh. Google Photos might have auto backed them up. Let me see. No, <laughs> you so know. The risk at, at, at the risk of oh, yeah. getting accused of putting barbecue in a box again, yeah. um, am I ever going to get an answer to if you've actually ever tried barbecue? Yeah, I did. Yeah, there's places around here that have it like that. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. what I'm okay. telling you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So uh, are you... Uh, are you? All right. So uh, see, here's the grill. I fire up the... This mm -hmm. is a Weber yeah. grill here. You see in this? Mm -hmm. All right. Are you with mm, me so far, the Noah? Kind. I'm with you so far. Okay. You put the charcoal in the grill. And, yep. uh, so far, I'm seeing grill. I'm still not seeing barbecue. So then here's the garlic. Look at that delicious garlic. Mm -hmm. Look at that. Tell me that doesn't look delicious. How do you How do you mince your garlic? I uh, I just squeezed it. I just squeezed it and I chopped it chopped it all up with the spatula in the butter. Uh, with the spatula, so you, you, see, you, you, you I, smash it. I drop it in there. See, look, see there it is, dropped in the butter, mm -hmm. frying. And then as I as it as it cooks, it also starts to kind of just fall apart as it is, and it kind of becomes more yeah. of a more of a of a garlic goop. And then I mm -hmm. brushed it mm -hmm. onto the chicken. So there's the chicken cooking mm -hmm. there, and you can see the, mm -hmm. the 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 roasted garlic on there. And then there's the uh, there's the wow. finished product. And if you look closely, you'll notice the edges of the chicken are caramelized. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. man, oh man, Noah. And then uh, I said, uh, oh, there's baby. Then I had to go wake up the baby. So mm -hmm. that's, that's the baby. Um, and she was probably upset until she saw the chicken. And then she got really, uh, really excited. You know, I took my daughter out. We went out to, uh, we, uh, well, I took my whole family out. But uh, usually my daughter just kind of eats off of mom and dad's plate. Well, the other day she grabbed, uh, I had chicken wings. And she grabbed one of my chicken wings. And I'm, she like, she sucked the, she she ate it down to the bone. Like she was really, really into that chicken like wing. Like a pro. Yeah, yeah, it was crazy. Like a pro. And she's like two years old. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm just telling you, yeah, that wasn't I didn't I didn't cook that in the ground, but uh, it was tasty as hell. It was extremely tasty, and then I fried up some green beans and. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, so I feel like it's not me putting barbecue in a box. I feel like it's you making incredibly delicious, tasty food, but wanting to call it something that it's not. It's kind of like let me see if I can frame this for you. It's kind of like installing gnome inside of Ubuntu and calling it Fedora. False. Even the False. Yeah, yeah. No. It's not no, it's not like no. putting it in a box. It's just you it's you're trying to make something that it's not. It doesn't it doesn't uh, it does not That compute. my friend is if it's cooked over coals and there is fire involved, it is a form. It's not barbecue. It's a form. It's a but it's a form. <laughs> I don't think it's a form. I think it's grilling. It is a form I think it's very of barbecue. Good <sighs> I got a badass new gnome extension. Oh yeah, I yeah. Want to see your badass new. Nose. I'm gonna I'm gonna go get it right now for the bonobs. This is actually extremely handy uh, when you have a really crappy crappy ISP like I do, uh, and it turns out just like the Washington area in general is having um, networking uh, issues. I guess like down in some of our, where basically it doesn't matter what ISP you have, if a lot of them come to this one area and it, there's just their over capacity. So, uh, you know, of course, I'm a big fan of the GNOME desktop, and uh, I got sure. me lots of GNOME extensions, and from time to time, because I'm a nerd, 
I just go browse the new extensions over at extensions.gnome.org. Okay, so mm-hmm. just big disclaimer. Yeah. Okay, all right, yeah, right, of course. Yeah. And uh, from time to time, uh, there's something new that jumps out at me. Now, these are always a bit of a gamble because sometimes somebody just tries something and they abandon it right away. But Ping Indicator is uh, the uh, yeah, and what it does is it just puts up in the corner of your uh, you, uh, you know on your uh, gnome toolbar there is the uh-huh. milliseconds to whatever response time. The response time to whatever IP you tell it to ping. Oh, By default, man. it pings Google DNS, and it does it every five seconds. And so you can just keep that up on your bar. And I, what I do is I get an idea of how the health of my internet connection is. So right now, I'm getting a 13.6 millisecond response time to Google DNS. That's way too high. 13.6 yeah. milliseconds is way too high, right? It's not like it's not like going to break me, but that could be why we're having some packet loss. That is beyond cool. In fact, I would argue that's probably more useful than the little network monitor thing that I have on Gnome. Yeah, yeah. You know what somebody had at the conference that I thought was really cool? Uh, they had a they were using Xmonad and they had an, they had some sort of I don't know what you call them in Xmonad, what I would call an extension, but it put a bar at the top of the screen and it showed their current IP address. I just yeah. thought that was cool. Yeah. I, I don't know that I necessarily need to see that information yeah. in my bar at all times, but yeah. it was really cool. Yeah, it, it, I, uh, smoke ping. If you remember, we've talked about smoke ping before. Uh, of course, that's way more complicated. And you gotta like on Arch, you gotta. It's easier to run it in a Docker. But uh, this is nice mm-hmm. because wherever I go with a laptop, I always kind of have a sense. And I even use this. Like uh, Chase and I, we did uh, some unfiltered show planning at a barbecue restaurant. We didn't, you know, we we're like. So I, I took my laptop and I I tethered to my Nexus using the XPS. And so I, could, I got a sense of what my tethered connection time was like, too. So I, it kind of helps me set my expectations when I'm using mm-hmm. a tethered connection. Handy tip. The handy tip.